I think basically it's very simple. As I see it, you you have makeup. Genius is in, in the art of, art of makeup, and one has to certainly use them. They have them. You have them at your at your fingertips. So why not take take advantage of them? I mean, let's say for instance, in a situation like um, Otello, which is the most obvious one, where a white a white person, a white man, has to play a, a black man. Well, he certainly is not going to go on to the opera opera stage or the or the legitimate theater stage uh, in white face. And I see no reason, uh, no reason whatsoever why a black person should be allowed, given the opportunity, to uh, go on stage uh, um, in, in blackface. I actually think that it's, uh, it's unprofessional to do so. You've mentioned some instances of black singers appearing uh, without makeup in... Yes, as a matter of fact, very recently I saw a performance of, uh, uh, of Tosca, uh, where the, the um, Angelotti... Uh, is a black man and he was not made up neither was he made up nor did he have a wig on and I from from my taste such as it is I found that it was it was uh, rather much like a, a high school performance which should not be in the Metropolitan Opera that should, should, should not happen it should be done everything should be done on a very professional basis or not at all what did you do when you made your Bayreuth debut as uh, Venus in yeah. Tannhäuser mm -hmm. Uh, did About, you, you mean as far yes, as makeup as is concerned? Makeup well, is I concerned. wasn't the makeup expert. Um, the, the, the Germans, Wilan Wagner and his makeup people, decided what they wanted to, to do. And uh, where they solved the issue with, with gold makeup. I was in, in brown and gold and, and silver. There was a tremendous flap at the time over that appearance. Uh, some in Germany were scandalized that a black was coming to uh, a shrine, what was perceived as a shrine to, well, to white culture, to Aryan culture. Yeah. Uh, hate mail was sent to Bayreuth. Columns were written. How did it all come to pass? How did it come to pass? You mean the hate, the hate mail, or the how did the uh, the, the, the engagement the to engagement. begin with? Well, the engagement came through an audition with um, <laughs> with Wieland Wagner and and his staff, and I was the one that was chosen to sing uh, Venus. There were many other singers who were present for that for that audition. Who many of them who were who were white, most of them who were white, and many who were German, and uh, he chose my voice over the others. And uh, as, as he said, and, and he has put it into print, that his grandfather wrote not for skin colors, but for vocal colors. And mine evidently fitted the, 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 the pattern that Mr. Uh, uh, Richard Wagner wanted. What in any event, what Wieland Wagner wanted in this case. What were some of the low points there? What happened? I don't remember any low points, actually, because um, I had such, an, uh, such a fantastic success, I couldn't possibly have had any low points. Uh, I really you, don't remember Were anything. you aware of, of hatred, of abuse, of racism? Well, you know, one is always aware of that. I mean, it's not in, just in Germany, it's also in America and vice versa, to put it whichever way you want to look at it. And uh, as a black person growing, uh, growing up, uh, you know that it exists. And you, you, are, you are certainly always aware of it. Uh, but you don't let it color your work. You have your work to do. You have a job that's cut out for you, and you bloody well get on doing it. And that's what I did. I couldn't let myself down, couldn't let my, my parents down, and also those persons who, were, who had been very, very helpful and um, uh, who had assisted me all along my, my, my struggle to get where I was. And I first, and on top of that, I couldn't let uh, Wieland Wagner down, who, who believed 100% in me, as did I. And uh, I, I had my job to do, and I did it. Those performances were pivotal to your career, oh. catapulting you to international stardom. That's right, that's right. What had happened before? Well, I had done, uh, let me think now, I, I went to Europe in 19, uh, 1959, spring. I went uh, around Europe um, just really sort of studying the atmosphere of the musical scene to get an idea of what's going on. I went to first to, to London. I took part in some master classes of Lotte Lehmann, who was my teacher, um, uh, there in Wigmore Hall. Uh, for two weeks she was there. We did some scenes from Valkyrie. We did some scenes from uh, um, So Angelica. Uh, I think we did something from Aida as well. Then from there I went on to, to Vienna, where I studied with Eric Verba. 
Yes. So the, the I've artist, studied with him too. Did you? Yes. He's great. Yes. I enjoyed him very much. Um, but I studied from him not only the, um, the art of, of recital music, but uh, oratorio. And that's really what I wanted to study with him before, uh, studying with him um, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than the leader, because I had already start, started that with Lehman, and, and that was for me. Lehman was for me really uh, the epitome of a, of a recitalist, and I didn't really need Eric Velber for that. But then after that, we went on to, to Bayreuth, and uh, just to see the performances, I saw Tristan and Isolde with uh, Birgit Nielsen, which was just mind-boggling. As a matter of fact, Madame Lehmann was very, very excited about it as well, because she couldn't imagine that uh, somebody with a, a voice of the size of uh, Birgit Nielsen could also have such a wonderful pianissimo on that, on that um, top, uh, I think it's a high C or B, whichever one it is. Uh, uh, in the narrative? Uh, the, yeah. the season, the narrative. Yeah. yeah. And she was so uh, amazed about that. Then from there, we went on up to... Uh, uh, back to, to, to Austria, we did, and then I went to Salzburg, and I studied at the Mozarteum, and I resumed my studies with Eric Verba, and then I took part in a contest that they give every year for the students, with every, from every teacher, and I was the ultimate uh, winner of that contest, and as a result of the contest, you had um, the opportunity to give a concert. And that's when all the European managers come around to see who the, who the, the, the new talent um, at that particular year is. And uh, so in any case, I, I signed a contract with the Opera House in Basel, much to the chagrin of Lord Harwood in London, because I had done a, a, um, an audition in London and they wanted me to come to London. And you'll read in his book where they were, they were very put out with me that I, that I didn't wait for their, for their letter. But be that as it may. Wait, in other words, you signed at Basel before I, Covent Garden yes. uh, had sent its contract. Yes. And the contract arrived too late. Yes. Exactly. Mm. And uh, as you see, I've always been a rather, um, how can I put it, um, uh, <laughs> ah, the kind of person who wants to get something done already yesterday. You know mm. what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I couldn't wait. I was very mm. anxious. And, and I, saw, I saw that um, uh, Covent Garden was, was uh, coming too late with their offer, and there was one sitting right there, and it, it, it sounded very good to me. I got all the roles that I wanted. And I was the, the the number one mezzo for the for the, the house, which meant that I got all of you know, all of the major major uh, uh, productions, and uh, so I accepted that. And actually, I'm rather glad. I'm I'm still not rather. I'm extreme, uh, extremely glad because I know that had I signed with Covent Garden, I would not be where I am today, because uh, you know people tend to take a young singer and just do with them as they please. And uh, in a house the size of Covent Garden, that probably would have happened. I mean, I can't be sure, for sure. But I, I would think that I would not have been able to get all of those wonderful major roles under my belt so quickly. I mean, I was in Basel for two years as a, what they call a, a fest engagement, you know, completely there all the time. And then one year as guest, because I had so many performances already by that time that I just didn't, didn't have the, the possibility to sit at, in, in Basel uh, the year round for third year. And uh, then after that, um, things just sort of took off. Then came the, the, the audition for Bayreuth. And, and some other performances in Paris, and other performances um, all over Europe, and the rest I think you pretty much know. What of Lehmann, reminiscences? Oh, Lehmann was a wonderful teacher, actually. You know, she, she did not teach voice, she taught uh, the art of interpretation of song and of opera, just the art of interpretation. And actually, I have to attribute my I think my operatic uh, life to Madame Lehmann, mm -hmm. because I really didn't go to the music academy to study opera. I wanted to be a recitalist. I wanted to be like Marian Anderson. I loved Marian Anderson. I wanted to do whatever she did. I mean, I, even down to the long red fingernails, you know. I mean, I just thought, I saw this wonderful woman, this tall woman. I was a little girl, of course, of 10 when I first saw her. And I, I saw this beautiful woman and with these long fingernails and, I, and this gorgeous voice. And I wanted, of course, to be like Marian Anderson. And then Lehman, when I got to the academy, Lehman insisted that I take the, um, the opera classes as well. And uh, I, I must say that I think she might have been right. I think she had a point there, because <laughs> I do have a dramatic nature, and that was what she saw. And I, of course, I didn't see that. I was too young to know that. And um, 
I can I can just say that she brought out something in me that I never thought I had. What specifically did you study with her? Oh, I studied Aida. I studied Cavalleria Rusticana. I did um, Ortrud. I did um, uh, Carmen. Some scenes only from Carmen, and uh, just and loads of recital music. I mean, just because because we had every week a new set of, uh, of songs to learn every week and an operatic scene. Now, uh, Lehman was, was of the school of thought that you didn't just learn an operatic scene and go the next week to another one. That had to be perfected. And sometimes you would be on an operatic scene, just one scene maybe, for perhaps two, two months. And that's a long time when you're repeating something time and time and time again. But you repeated it until you got it, the way it became second nature. And that's what, what operatic singing is about, when it's exciting. Do you recall specific points of interpretation, pointers that she gave? No, I don't think we, I could really demonstrate that here mm -hmm. on, on this program, because one would, have, one would have to hear it in order to understand what I'm talking about. You sometimes appear not just in in white roles, for which I gather you use white face? Well, but yes, um, according to the geographic uh, ne necessity. I mean, let's say, for instance, um, uh, Cavalry Rusticana yeah. certainly is not as white as uh, Lady Macbeth, uh, uh, or Macbeth is, which is uh, Scottish. As a matter of fact, Lady Macbeth is probably my lightest role, mm -hmm. lightest in color. And because I find that the Scots are very, very fair people, and uh, so I try to make my makeup uh, as 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 light as I can without making it look ridiculous. I mean, one has to take into consideration my dark skin, and you don't want it to look also uh, like a mask. Um, Cavalleria Rusticana, the uh, Santuzza. I, t I think, if I'm not mistaken, I use number 31 of Max Factor. Um, Carmen is also number 31. Um, um, Tosca is number 29, uh, which is, you see, it's, it's coming up more northerly, so she's a little bit, a little bit lighter. Um, what I do is for number 25, 25, um, um, Amneris, I can use a, a combination of 27 and 25, it depends on how the highlights I want for that. Uh, um, uh, Lady Macbeth, I've told you that's number, that's number 21, I believe. And uh, but it's not just the base itself; it's also how you how you uh, contour it. Mm -hmm. You have to know, mind you. I did take the art of, of makeup at, at Max Factors in London, so I know pretty much what I'm doing. I don't usually have to count on uh, a makeup person at the Metropolitan, even though they're very good. They, they give me also pointers, but I know what I'm doing when I get on when I put my makeup on. It's not just haphazardly uh, something that Bumber has <laughs> slapped on. How, <laughs> how long does it take? Well, it depends. I, I, I go to the opera house, and I'm, I'm usually there two hours before the opera starts. I mean, this is just my yeah. habit. Whether it's Aida, where I need hardly any makeup at all, or whether it's, um, or whether it's Lady Macbeth. So I'm, I'm, there, I'm, I'm there at 6 o'clock anyway, sometimes even a quarter to, quarter to 6. What a relief it must be to perform Aida and oh, uh, I can't African. Tell you. Africana and Aida are my favorite roles because I don't have to put on all of that gook, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, because, you know, with, um, with all the other roles, I'm there before everybody else, and I'm the last one out. The worst opera for me was, was, uh, was Salome because we had the whole body to do. Mm. I mean, you had the dance and you, had, you, had, you couldn't have your face one color and the body another color. So I, 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 you, you have to take time, you know. This is a profession. It's not just a, 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 an avocation. It's not just a hobby. It's a, a proper profession. Would that this were TV. Miss Bumbry is here with the most gorgeous eyes. We all know that she's got gorgeous eyes and a gorgeous <laughs> face. However, uh, there's a lot of very subtle shading around the eyes. Deftly handled eye makeup, not for the stage, but for the street. A lesson f for anyone who ever f uh, wishes to use makeup. Do you want to share mm -hmm. any of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my secret. <laughs> The black throat, the black soft palate, the black vibrato, observations, insights. You know, I would, I would like to say that's all rubbish, but I'm, I don't know. I don't know if it's rubbish or not. I don't know a thing about the palates. 
All I know is that I use them, you see. Mm -hmm. Whether it's high or low or whatever, I just use it. Now, let's go on let's go on a step further about the black voice. There is definitely a black voice. I mean, there is no question about it. Um I, but I don't see why we get so worked up about it. I mean, there is the, there is the Slavic voice, there is the Anglo-Saxon voice, there's the Italian voice. Why not be there um, an, uh, uh, an African voice? We are Afro Afro-Americans, so we have what we call an African voice. It is certainly definitely different. It's it's as I think it's darker and warmer, um, and I think many of my many of, of my colleagues think the same thing. And I don't mean just my black colleagues. And um, uh, this conversation was also held with Luciano Pavarotti. We talked about that, and, and he said the same thing. It's definitely a different sound, and it's a warmer sound. And now, whether it's a higher palate or a thinner palate or a, um, a green leg or a brown leg, I don't know. All I know is that it is a definitely a different sound. But let's, let's, let's go even a, a bit simpler. Let's back up. Even the speaking voice of a black is different than the speaking voice of a white. I mean, everybody hears that. If you hear me, even you hear the, the speaking voice of an African, it's certainly different. You know that it's an African speaking. And if you, and if you hear uh, the speaking voice of, of, uh, of an Italian, you know it's an Italian voice, even regard, regardless of, the, uh, of the, uh, the accent, I mean, of the, uh, the language. You hear a certain sound. So naturally, if you hear that sound in the speaking voice, you're going to hear it also in the singing voice. It hardly, there's hardly any difference. Can throat doctors shed light on these differences? I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I think it really depends upon the doctor. Mm -hmm. As you know, there are singers, and, and there are singers. And there are doctors, and there are doctors. Now, Dr. Grabscheidt was a genius. Now, Dr. Grabscheidt unfortunately died last February. And uh, before he died, uh, um, we talked about this subject of, bla of the black voice when Shirley Verrett and I did that, con the, that concert at Carnegie Hall, because that was this big article in the, time mag in the New York Times um, Sunday section about the black voice. So I went to Dr. Grob, tried to ask him what his opinion was of, of this, and he said, as, so he says, anatomically, of course, we're all the same. But it goes without saying that that um, it, it, it all depends upon degrees. It, it, it has to, a lot to do with thicknesses and the resonators and all that sort of stuff. I can't begin to explain it all to you myself, but be that as it may, that is a difference. You were commenting the other day on the phone that it, it is of no avail for a singer to know uh, his or her physiology as yes. far as actual singing is concerned. Yes. You don't rely on, on that kind of, of thing at all. No, I don't. As a matter of fact, it's only confusing to me. And uh, I, I got, this is not my, my, my statement. I got mm. that statement from Dr. Norman Punt, who has a book out. Um, he's a, he's a, an English uh, a throat specialist, a very, very, very famous one. And uh, his book, I think it's called The Care, The Care of the Speaking, uh, Professional si Speaking and Singing Voice. And uh, this was only one little, one little line that I underlined, and that was that, um, what was that? What was you saying? I've forgotten already. <laughs> well, that it's useless. To, it is useless you know. for a singer or a speaker to even to even uh, try to understand it because it's it's just as to no avail whatsoever. Just as it would be beside the point for a cricket player to uh, to know about the shoulder exactly. joint you mentioned. Exactly. Yeah. To be accurate, yes. Well, a certain Dr. Broadness. 20 years ago held that owing to my height and the consequent distance between I'm six feet and the consequent d distance between my diaphragm and my larynx that I had to be a bass maybe bass mm -hmm. baritone and because without the beard one can see my Adam's apple I have a big prominent larynx he was convinced that I had to be a bass I pointed out some counterexamples tall tenors Corelli Melchior, McCormick, Dureshka, quite a few others. Well, they were just pushed up whatever, pushed up baritones, pushed up basses. Speaking of pushed up, uh, Robert Jacobson in Opera People called you, Grace Bunbury, a pushed up mezzo. Well, you know, he might have a good point there, but uh, so what? All sopranos are pushed up one way or the other. 
what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole history of, uh, uh, the whole, let's say, the whole um, career of a, of a soprano is, is, is in keeping that, making that top as, as far as you can go with it. So what difference does it make? I mean, Robert Jenkins can say what he wishes to say. Does he sing? No, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I don't think he's a teacher either, is he? No. A voice teacher? No. I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. But, you know, he's got his opinion. And I think he's a, a critic, isn't he? Yes. And they all have their opinions, such as they are. Yes. Um, are you a mezzo or a soprano? I don't know what I am. I just sing the, the, the material that I, that I see fits my voice. If it happens to be mezzo material, I will sing it. If it happens to be also called soprano material, then, I, then, I'm, then I, I'm a soprano. Whatever you want to call me. I don't, I don't, then I don't mind. You think the main those thing, just spell my name correctly, that's all. You think those categories are relevant pigeonholes? In most cases, they are relevant because most singers fit into a pigeonhole. Mm. But, I'm, I, but I don't fit into a pigeonhole. As did uh, Madame Falcon, did mm. not fit into a pigeonhole. As does Shirley Verrett not fit into a pigeonhole. Falcon, uh, a singer of the 1820s and 30s, uh, had a dark voice, uh, thought to be soprano, but with uh, what today would have would be considered a mezzo tinge. And uh, there are voice types called Falcon, uh, named after her. Uh, sopranos who, mezzos who sing sopranos, sopranos who sing mezzo. Uh, Falcon's voice seems to have been fairly substantial. She created uh, the uh, dramatic soprano, or if you will, high mezzo part in Les Huguenots as well as many other important roles. What? But tell me, Stefan, do you know when this delineation came into being? I can trace, you mean between mezzo and soprano. Uh -huh. I can trace the term uh, baritone. Uh, it came into general use with George Joron Colney, a baritone of the 30s, 1830s and 40s. Uh, I've written extensively about uh, about the development of the tenor voice, but the voice that remains a mystery to me is the mezzo. I'm not clear who was the first mezzo. In Rossini's day, there were contraltos with deep voices. Uh, uh, the music for them lies low and centers around, say, middle C to the F or G above and plummets to low F sharp. Uh, he that wrote, is really a true yes, contralto, yes. then, I think. Those, those ladies occasionally went to high B, but the tessiture centered very, very low. Verdi wrote f uh, parts today thought of as mezzo, which were all but indistinguishable in tessitura from soprano roles, Eboli. Who was the first mezzo? I'm not aware that there was such a person. Those women all used chest voice. Uh, they all, the, the singers of dramatic roles yeah, at that time. Yeah, but there are a lot of sopranos who use chest voice, Yes, too. exactly, so, exactly. Oh. So the distinction is blurry, unlike many other distinctions uh, in vocal history. Early in this century, there was, there was still a race of contraltos and a race of sopranos. Few early singers are, uh, are mezzos, were few early singers to record are what we would think of as, as mezzos. Eugenia Mantelli in the 90s and, and just after the turn of the century, well, her voice seems to have been decidedly lighter than Grace Bumbry's. But did any composers really write for a mezzo voice? One would have to look at the scores for that to see when, when composers began to use the term mezzo-soprano. No. I'm not sure. And neither am I. Uh, there's work to be done there. <laughs> I'm not sure even if one did work at that, if one could, could come up with anything very helpful, since often composers are not specific about such things. They write the name of the character and uh, don't designate a voice type. Uh, in the 30s and 20s, uh, 1930s and 20s, clearly there were mezzo-sopranos. Before that, there are borderline cases. You know, the Germans have a very good term that they use for 
for a borderline case like that. They call it the, the, the suspicion the fact. Suspicion fact. Which yeah. I think is very, very apropos. Between categories. Yeah. What of Wagner, specifically Brunhilde, outside of the war cry, the tessitura for soprano is low? Yeah. You, I, you know, I, I've thought a number, a number of times of, of, of doing Brunhilde, especially since um, Lotte Lehmann um, suggested that I do that, since she was, since she was convinced after having heard my Salome that I could uh, could sing the soprano um, uh, repertoire. So her idea was that I do um, uh, all the Brunhilde, starting with the Valkyrie and going, of, of course, up eventually to the to the uh, Goethe Dameron. But I. I don't think that one should, should sing something which they don't feel comfortable doing. I don't mean I don't mean uh -huh. vocally, because because I'm sure that the the, the notes of uh -huh. Brunhilde are no problem for me. It's just that I don't feel psychologically comfortable in that role, and I don't think that I could give it my very best if it's something that I really cannot believe in. Is there something about the part or the music that you find off-putting? No, it's not the music. But the I, character. I think it's the character, yeah. And I think it's also that, that Nordic um, way. Yeah. I mean, but it's very strange because I can, I can um, relate to Elizabeth from, uh, from Tannhäuser because I sing Elizabeth and Venus uh, mm -hmm. very often in performances. I can relate to that, but maybe because it's, it's, uh, it's real. Whereas I find, I may, I may be completely wrong, but I find Oh, that that the, the whole ring thing is is mythology, and I can't really put my fingers in, in into it. I can't get myself involved in it sufficiently. I can't relate to it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody has to teach me I, uh, otherwise, but I can't feel it yet. You remarked on the phone, I place my voice where I want to. The yeah, middle in the voice. middle register, uh, uh, for sure, yeah. Yes. Uh, where do you place your voice? Depending on what the role is and what and what and what I'm singing about, what that particular phrase is about. Um, let's say, you know, there was a remark that was made, I think, in the in one of the newspapers. I can't remember which one it was, but it was in, it, to to the Aida review, and he said that Bunbury's middle voice was out of pitch. Well, it wasn't out of pitch at all. It was just that I placed it differently, and probably his ears were not accustomed to hearing that that placement for those notes. And I really believe that because I've listened to I have my own uh -huh. little taping system, you see, and I thank God for the, for these little cassettes because you can really judge what has been sung and what has not been sung. Yes. Because if you wouldn't buy what the reviewers wrote, you really would be in a quandary. So you have these um, the, these these tapes. I have my own little uh, my little cache <laughs> of um, of uh, tapes, and I I I realize what he's talking about, but he, I wasn't off pitch at all. It's just that one is not accustomed to hearing so much voice in a particular area in the mezzo in the mezzo voice, and I don't mean volume. I mean placement of tone. Um. Where did you place your voice for Amneris in the middle? I can't explain it to you in words. You have to hear it. Mm. And as I'm not singing tonight, you'll be, you still won't know, will you? <laughs> did, yeah. did you place... Uh, c can you describe the difference or the difference in results Jonathan, between give the... give me an F. Mm -hmm. I can sing it like that, or I can sing it... Now, which one do you prefer? Do you hear the difference? Neither. I think I would prefer one in one con context, the I, other in that's another. That's exactly yeah. my point. That's exactly the point. It depends on what I'm trying to portray. If I want to portray anger, uh, I use it one way. If I want to portray, portray sweetness, I use it another way. Can you describe what you were doing, what sensations you were feeling? No, I can't tell you that. I, can't, I couldn't possibly show you. Nor could I explain it. I just know that I can do it. Is it that you would prefer not to explain no, no, it? No, or no, 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 not at all. I just don't know how to explain it's it. It's something you. intuitive, then. It's something my voice will do. My throat will will allow me to do it, <laughs> and I think a lot has to do with having studied with Lotte Lehmann, uh. because when you study the art of of song, you try to find certain colors for certain words, 
And I think that, that I have carried that over also in, into, into my operatic singing. Maybe that's the reason. I, I, I don't know. But, I, but in, in having studied um, uh, the art of, of leader, I know that I had to look for certain colors. I know that. I remember that. Uh, what of your vocal technique? Are you aware of technique when you sing, or do you just sing? I try not to. I try to, when I get to the point of, of, of going onto the stage, I don't want to have to think of technique, because for me, technique is, technique is, is, is confining. And for me, to sing means to, to, to sing well means to sing free, to sing with, the, with a free throat. Now, whether you have to find a technique to free your throat, you see, it's all very convoluted, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's very difficult to explain. But you've got to find a technique uh, that you can use that will free your throat so that you can, uh, can sing with a technique. <laughs> you studied with Tokakia. I was about to say you don't have a technique, you see. You studied with Armand Tokakia. I did. That was my, that was, uh, actually, I think I have two teachers that I really give a, an enormous amount of credit to. And that was my very first teacher, which, as you know, is a, is a very important person. And, and then uh, Tokatian. Those two, he was my, one was my first and one was my last. And Tokatian was my last teacher be before I went off to Europe. And unfortunately, he died, I think, the spring that, that, um, that I went off to Europe. Or was it the following spring uh, of 60? Wait, 60. who is the first teacher? Kenneth Billups. He's dead, also died last year. What did they teach? They taught, well, th it's very strange. They taught me of what I was doing with my voice be because they both said that my voice was already so well placed by nature that there was not much to do. Uh. But they wanted me to know what I was doing because that is what will, will, will um, carry me through down a long career uh. such as I've had. Now, my first teacher certainly was not thinking about that. All he was thinking of getting the voice placed. And he said to me, now, after a year and a half of studies, I have given you as much as I can give you. Now you must go on to another teacher. Where did he attempt to place the voice? Right forward, right forward, as you hear it. For, would you point forward, I call it what I call it in the front of the face, in the mask of the face. Specifically, would you point to, to, to the... Here. Uh, Miss Bunbury is pointing to the eyes, the cheeks, All in the and of the face. I think when I when I emit the sound, I think as far forward as I can think. If I, it depends again on the sound. If I want to e sing a, a very ethereal sound, I don't want that. I don't want that placement. I want it somewhere else for that. The area seems to encompass the nose, the teeth, the lower teeth even. No, when, I, when I, you I don't know. Yeah. I just I, I I think forward. When you moved your hand around your face, uh, it covered it even the area below the yeah. mouth. Yeah, you know, from uh, just above the eyebrows to, to below the to below, below the, chin? the below the chin. Huh. You brought a number of cassettes for us to play yes. here on WKCR FM in New York, eighty nine point nine on the dial. Uh, we'll be talking further about Dimitrova, Martin, Verrett. Leontine Price, Corelli, Milo, many, many others. Uh, it should be quite an evening. <laughs> what would you like to play? Why don't we start off with Salome, the final scene of Salome? I think I have pretty much set where it should be. Mm. Is there anything we should know, or should we just plunge in? Well, I, I think the reason I chose this as, as uh, the first piece is because it was my first, what I would call my, um, my first true soprano role, even though I had done Lady, Mac Lady Macbeth before that. But it was my, um, absichtlich, what do you call it, absichtlich? Oh. Uh, um, oh, I can't think of the word now. I can't think of yeah. <laughs> It's so difficult. Uh, it was the, it, well. It was it, it was the, 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 the one opera that I chose uh, as a measuring rod, mm. uh, if whether I, whether or not I will go into the soprano repertoire or not. And as I as, as I as I was successful in it, I think we should want to hear that one first, and when then we'll go on from there. When was this performance? That uh, this performance, I'm not so sure which one I have here. 
that have so many Salome. Right. Um, but I think the first time I sang Salome was in Covent Garden in 1970, 69 or 70. I think it was 70, though. Well, well I think this recording might have been in Chicago. I have so many little, pri my own little pirate tapes of my own, but I think this is Chicago. We'll be hearing Miss Bunbury in selections from Salome, Joconda, Nabucco, Macbeth, and time permitting, Turando. Uh, and we'll be talking extensively. The number here, should you care to call, comment, or ask questions, is 212 8 um, Stuart Manville, critic for Opera Magazine, phoned in to say that one of the most th thrilling uh, series of performances he ever heard were three given by Grace Bumbry in Paris in uh, Ducas' Ariane et Barbe Bleu. Uh, this is a tough part where the singer is on almost for the entire opera, one of the longest roles. I'm ho so happy Grace Bunbury is on the show, declared Mr. Manville. Grace Bunbury reminiscences about those performances and that role. And I, I thank the gentleman very much because uh, he certainly was right. It's, it is a physical feat like none I've ever known. Um, it's extremely difficult because it was a style of music that I, that I had to learn, uh, very much like um, Strauss. Uh, actually, it was a, a, a kaleidoscope, I think, of, of composers. Um, you, you heard sometimes bits of Strauss, you heard bits of uh, Rimsky-Korsakov, Rimsky you heard uh, many, many, many composers. And, uh, but, B uh, but more importantly than that is, is that it was, a, it was a new style for me, and it was something that the, the French had not had in a long, long time. And uh, I must say I did have a, a very, very great success in it, and, and I appreciate this, this caller's remark about it. Thank you very much. Bernard Leopold, a new caller, declared, I'm a professional writer. I followed Miss Bumbry's career for many years, and it's one of the most exciting. I would like to do a Bumbry biography, but I've been told that she is very private. And he asks, would you be against someone writing a full-length biography? Uh, full-length biographies have been written for many lesser artists. Your career is worth my time and effort. It would be um, a, fanta a fascinating story one would have to have access to you, and you are said to be private. And I've been too shy to approach <laughs> Miss Bumper, declared Bernard Leopold. Well, I'm, I'm very grateful for his uh, request and for his lovely comments. However, I have been asked by three other publishing houses. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Weidenfeld and Nicholson, uh, Dodd Mead, and Macmillan. And unfortunately, I just don't have the time just now. But um, if you'd be so kind as to leave your address with Mr. Zucker, I will certainly bear it in mind when I do decide to uh, have a book written. I've already taken the address, <laughs> just <laughs> in you. case. Uh, Call here from Ed Bowley of Elmhurst. He, Mr. Bowley declares the singing voice and speaking voice uh, have different training requirements. Sills couldn't sing with her Brooklyn accent. And I wonder about your view. What, do you, what does he mean? She, she, you, she can't sing with her Brooklyn well, accent. Well, in other words, her singing voice is trained so that the Brooklyn accent doesn't show, I think he's saying. And he claims well, that... Well, I don't that think the composer wrote for Brooklynese. I thought, he, I thought he wrote either in Italian or French or, 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 or German or whatever the case it was that she was singing. It has nothing to do with her English language. Yes. Well, uh, I think he's... It can't be separate. Well, what of... Uh, I think he maybe maybe he means in how one applies it goes without saying that you 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 speak one way and you sing another way because um, first of all you sing you sing controlled and speaking you don't really sing with great great, great control. Uh, Jonathan Brown called to inquire about the status of the program. 
will I be alternating with a student host? Yes. Uh, I will be on on the 15th when the sketch phoned to ask what of Jana Dimitrova's statement in Opera News about certain mezzos switching to soprano parts and now Dimitrova herself is singing Amneris. Well, actually, he, he took my ammunition away by telling me what she sang, because I also knew that she had sung the, um, the Amneris at La Scala, as a matter of fact, la last season. And I find it really quite interesting in view of the fact, you know that the Italians have a wonderful saying, I think it was even Pavarotti who said it, um, uh, prima critica e poi copia. Uh -huh. In other words, uh, first you criticize and then you copy. And I think that really should be the answer and uh, sufficient. But um, I do want to go on a, a bit further on about uh, Madame Dimitrova. I heard her in, in New York City here at Carnegie Hall during, during uh, Nabucco. I think it was last year or year before, I forget now. And um, I must say I was a bit disappointed because, I, 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 mind you, I knew she had a big voice. I, I knew it. I was, I was expecting that. But I was hoping that she would be able to give us a bit more nuances in what she, in what she did. And um, since, since she's, you know, reportedly such a great, such a great artist. And uh, unfortunately, that was not forthcoming. I was quite sad about that, and um, I got rather fed up with hearing, hearing nothing but loud singing the whole evenings. And I, I had to leave. Unfortunately, I think I had to leave um, for more than one reason, not only, not only because I got rather tired of uh, just loud singing, but because I, I was flying that next day back to Europe, and I didn't have to have the energy to, to sit around and, and listen to the entire con the concert. But what I did hear, I, I was very impressed with her, with the size of the voice, and uh, and also her wonderful stage stage uh, comportment. I thought was very beautiful, and uh, you know all things like this we always look at. Ladies look at what you, what your hairdo was like, and what your gown was like, and what shoes you wore, and how you moved on stage. And uh, I found those, of course, all very, very positive. But um, to her remark that was in the, in, in the opera news, I can just simply quote uh, Pavarotti, prima critica e poi copia. Uh, what of Eva Martin? Uh, that's a good question, too, because I think uh, Madame Dimitrova said that uh, except for herself and, and, and Ava Martin, there were no other dramatic sopranos around. Now, I think she might be certainly correct when she says uh, that she is a dramatic soprano, but as far as Ava Martin is concerned, I do not, I definitely do not think that she's a dramatic soprano at all. And um, I think that she has a, a very sizable lyric soprano voice, which she has pushed uh, to to make it make it um, full, give it give it a certain fullness to it, but it it is not a dramatic soprano voice, and I think the the, the best um, uh, clue to that is uh, when you remember, if you at all l listen to the German operas, um, when she sang the role of Ortrud in uh, comparison to her role of uh, Elsa. The Elsa is much more beautiful and much more warm and much um, uh, more loving. The Autru, to my ears, was a, a, a bit, uh, stretching it a bit, and rather screechy. I mean, I don't think that Ava, I mean, that um, Ava Martin is a dramatic soprano, and I know voices rather well. Isn't Autru, though, by nature, more screechy? Certainly she's screechy, but, but within, <laughs> within limits. Uh, Shirley Barrett, your rival? You know, this is a very interesting word you use here because you never said it about, about Dimitrova. You never said it about uh, Martin. Well, Why do you say it about Shirley Barrett? Because uh, she's black? No, because Why? a few years ago, the two of you gave uh, concerts at Conkey Hall and at, was it Albert Hall? Which hall in uh, London? Royal Opera Ro House Royal, Royal, Garden. Royal Opera House. And you received a great deal of publicity. Not only were you on the uh, cover of the uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine, but you were actually, as I remember, on the cover of page one of the Times. That's true. Uh, you received, I, I understand, equivalent publicity in England. 
in the discussions of your performances together, it was mentioned by several writers that you two had not been particularly friendly and were wrong. Well, we are not friends. No, we are not friends. I'm not saying that I am that I am unfriendly towards her, but we are not friends. I mean, Jonathan Morris is a friend who is my pianist as well. Curtis Dalby is a friend who is my secretary as well. I hope you are a friend too. Yes. <laughs> but but um, uh, Shirley Barrett and I, we sing together. Mm. She is, uh, we, we might be rivals in the sense that we sing the same repertoire. Well, so does um, for Fiorenza Cosotto, so does Marilyn Horn, so does um, Gina Dimitrova. But that doesn't mean that we are not. Well, the Ayat as I recall, the Ayatollah Harold C. Schoenberg himself <laughs> declared you rivals. <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> What'd you call him again? <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, so rivals you are. Uh, <laughs> what's Verrett like as a person? How is it that you're not exactly friendly? Well, you know, that's very, it's just, I don't know. We, we just are not. I don't have many friends among the singers. I mean, when you talk about friends, as I talk about friends, it's somebody that you get on the phone with and talk with almost every day. Mm -hmm. For me, that is a friend. But somebody that I talk to once in a while, for me, that is an acquaintance. Maybe I'm, I, I've got, gotten this from the, from the European way because they don't take friends so quickly as we in America. We call somebody a friend. Have you met them over uh, uh, yesterday? That's a friend. But I, I don't see... Um, I don't see friendship that way. Um, Shirley Verrett is a very fine singer, and I enjoyed singing with her. We we um, we have maybe we have some some kind of electric uh, uh, between us because because of what people think is a rivalry, because what she thinks is a rivalry, what I think is a rivalry, maybe I don't know. But but in any event, what what the uh, the outcome is is what's important. Up to a point, you have common histories. Like you, she began singing mezzo roles, but then switched to soprano. Yeah. And today, I believe, performs both, largely concentrating now on mezzo parts. I don't know. I don't think yeah. so, because I just heard her this year singing Medea in Paris. And that's definitely not a mezzo part. Yes. So I, don't, I don't know where you got that. You perform duets together. Uh, yes. How did you decide who was going to sing the soprano line, who the mezzo? Well, that wasn't so, so easy, but we sort of uh, <laughs> stared each other down <laughs> until we decided, well, you sung uh, this and that in, in, uh, in New York, and, and, and I've not, so let me do this, this, this. The Maria, Maria Stuart, no, sorry, the Anna Bolena. She had already done uh, the role of, um, of uh, what's her name? Giovanna. Giovanna, Giovanna Stuarda. But I had not done either one or the other. So rather than have her learn some new music, I just learned the part of Anna Bolena. And she just continued to sing. The, um, you know, one has to use their common sense as well. Mm. One has to be also a little bit, um, a little bit uh, pliable. One is, it's like in, when, you, when you're singing in an opera, when you're working with a stage director, you have to also give a little bit. You can't just expect everything yourself hmm? you named on the the other day on the phone you named some favorite singers leontine price with whom also you've not been especially friendly yeah you, you see remarked. again that's my point i like certain voices but that does not mean that that um, that I, I like that person i don't have to like that person i mean there are millions of persons out there listening to your to, to your program who possibly possibly don't like me they might like my voice and vice versa they might like my voice and not me mm. but i, I many things are like my voice that's all i care about <laughs> <laughs> what a price is singing what part of it do you admire in particular i love that that beautiful top that she has that that effortless top I think it's just unbelievable how she just seems to sit up there and just walk around with it as if it's nothing. Though the tenor fanatic contest, Corelli versus uh, Del Monaco versus Di Stefano versus Tucker, had officially closed, you voted for, uh, for Corelli. Yes. How come? Because um, of the excitement that that, that voice um, uh, generates. Um, it's an extremely masculine sound. It's um, 
very exciting for my ears at least I mean they, they, perhaps there are those who, who don't find it that way but uh, I, I was always moved when I heard him sing and as a matter of fact I kind of in a way um, base my volume my prowess and my vocal volume from um, from working with Corelli because in order for you to uh, to exist at all, you had to try to at least try to match his his volume. I mean, there are not many persons who can match it, but that's why I say you tried. It's not like today where you have this. Oh well, that's not that's another story. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, will you tell us that story? Well, we'll get to it at some point, I'm sure. Well, uh, earlier we were to have heard the final scene from Salome. <laughs> uh, I, do you gentlemen have that ready to go in the studio with me? But you know, my, my point is that if since you have already yes. played one Joconda and we had another oh, fine, Joconda, fine, so fine, why don't we stay with Joconda and then come to the to the Salome? You Would you tell mind? us about the Joconda excerpt which we heard? I, we were, there's a little bit of chaos here, but presumably we're past that. I, I forgot what it was. Uh huh. I, I couldn't hear it. I think it was the scene. Um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a scene where. Gioconda and her mother are passing through San Marco, and um, uh, it's Im immediately after the after the the friar has 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 sung. Is that not that that's the spot? Was that was that was that it? And um, she's begging her mother to 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 uh, so, what do you call it? Support her, sorreggi mio mio madre, because I, of my weakness. I, I simply need need you to help me now. I I've helped you, so you help me now. I think that was the, that was that scene. In any case. No, I, if you don't mind. By all means, which side? Uh, um, 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 side B. Right. Uh, we'll, Grace Bumper and I will be talking about many singers. Olivero, uh, Giaura, Freni, Aprile, Milo, many others. If there are points you'd care to address, please phone us here at 212-280-5223. That's too many of that. Um, is there anything that you'd care to set in perspective, or should no, you? No, but I thought you might want to be interested to know that that, that was Richard Tucker singing there, um, the part of Ainso, fresh as ever in his uh, of, of voice, shortly, maybe a couple of years before he died, actually, I think, if, if not mistaken. A number of listener comments. Maestro Pasquale Ruizzi. Best regards to Grace Bumbry. She sang with me with the Coro d'Italia. Ah, of course. Casta Diva. She can sing both mezzo and soprano. Oh. Seth Wellens of Queens. I heard Grace Bumbry do a series of Adal Jesus at Covent Garden. She stole the performance the performances from Caballé, uh, who was a statue. Um, how does Miss Bumbry psych herself up to perform when the other protagonist is unresponsive? <laughs> well, it's not, it's not easy, I can tell you that, but be that as it may, um, the uh, literature is still there and uh, the drama is there you have also the music blasting away in the orchestra so you go you you look, live on 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 wings of song simple as that i find uh, i think the gentleman was a bit exaggerating about about uh, madame caballé because um, she was not exactly a statue i mean that's really a, not really very fair but um in cases where you have a singer who doesn't respond to you of course it's difficult um, uh, but you have to do what you have to do as best you can. Mr. Wellens continues, uh, within the same series of performances, Grace Bumbry moved from Adal Giza to Norma. Mm -hmm. What did that entail? He means in, uh, I, I suppose he means, how, what does it entail in, 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 the, in the transition? I would imagine vocally or interpretively. Well, I, I assume he means vocally because, um, Interpretively, it's, it's, a, it's another role, isn't it? Whether it's Adagiza or Norma or XYZ role, it's a role you have to interpret. But as far as the, as the music is concerned, one has to remember that the role, the role of uh, Adagiza is not much lower uh, than uh, the role of Norma. Um, the only change I find really is in, um, 
is in the characterization. Therein lies the difference because I, as I said to earlier on, my nature is a, a rather dramatic one. So I have to scale my my movements and my thoughts and my feelings down for the role of uh, Adal Jesus because she's a, she's a much softer and a much younger um, a priestess than, than I am. So I, I've, got, I've got to be more loving and, 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 and young. Whereas in, in the role of Norma, it's, um, it's exactly, the, exactly the opposite, isn't it? We seldom hear the two duets for Adal Jesus and Norma in the written keys. When you think, uh, when when you sing the part of Aldal Jesus, do do that. In which keys do do that? We sing that in the original transposed key that everybody transposes it in. No, oh, which is uh, a step down from the from the original. Am I correct, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. uh, so that the the top notes are B naturals or That's correct. B naturals I, half and step I, down. And I believe yeah. the reason is because if you hear it sung in the original key. It, it's 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 too bright. It's too it's too white of sound. It doesn't have the warmth that the, that the B B natural, isn't it? B flat. B flat. B flat is. It's a whole tone down, isn't it? Yeah. Correct. Mm. And um, uh, I don't th even think that uh, Mer that uh, Marilyn Horn and uh, Sutherland did it in that in the in the original key either. In performance, uh, they put them down in. Uh, in, on recording, they s sang Well, I'm sure we could do it also on recording. It's no problem to sing it in recording. You, you sit in front of a microphone and, and, and you sing it enough times until you get it right. But, in, um, uh, but when you sing it in the course of an evening, that's a different story altogether because you, 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 you've, you have to know how to stagger it and you have to also know how, how much energy you have. And uh, also, you want the beauty of the... Of the um, of the uh, the part to come out in a recording where where it goes down for for history, it's important that it's done in the original key. I think. John uh, Donlan of Brooklyn, a uh, new caller. I was at Grace Bumbry's old Met debut, and I've been a fan ever since. Thank you. At Marine Park in Brooklyn, Grace Bumbry berated the sound technicians that she couldn't hear her voice. This was at the Aida's. But her voice came through loud and clear. People around us suggested that maybe Miss Bumbry resented that the mics helped Aprile Milo, giving her volume she wouldn't have had in the house. Also, Mr. Uh, Donlon would like to know what of Aprile Milo's interpolated high E flat at the end of the triumphal scene. Does he mean uh, in the in the house or does he mean out in the park? Both. Well, in the in the in the park, I think it was quite fine because it's it's outside. The whole atmosphere is kind of kind of uh, free and and ad libitum. But I think in the opera house, I, I don't think it's it's befitting to put it in the in in the in uh, uh, high E flat in in the um, in in that performance. I just don't think it's right. No. But mind you. If I had one to sing, I'd put it in, too. <laughs> <laughs> How hard do you sing? I vocalize to an E-flat, but I, I, I don't dare try it in public. How I can sing to a D. How low do you go? I, I don't try to go down low. I only go, I do only go as far as the music will, will allow me. Maximum an A, below is, middle C. Is that for I can sing lower. I can sing down to a D if I want to. In Zalame upcoming, there's a low, is it G-flat? Uh, G flat, I, yeah. I believe it is. Yeah. Which is an F, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, it's an F sharp. G flat, F sharp. Do you, do you prefer to avoid singing lower than than uh, those written uh, notes to spare the voice in some way? For I don't reasons need them. of Who vocal needs, health? I don't need those notes. Right. Why should I work on them if I don't need them? Yeah. Do you have occasion to sing high D in any of your no, roles? D no, flat is no. Lady Macbeth. D flat is the highest. Yes. Thank God for that. That it, that it is the highest. I don't need to sing any higher than that. Well, it's interesting that Mr. Donlon spoke of this question about you and Milo and asked whether you felt that uh, the mics uh, gave Milo a vine that she didn't have otherwise because after uh, those Aida's, I think after the Central Park Aida, one of Milo's adherents said that the audio engineers sabotaged her, oh, turning off 
her mic, and that's why the audience heard you and not her. What really happened? And what I, I haven't a clue what happened. I, it's none of my doing, anyway. And I do recall in one performance, I don't know which one it was, I think it was the middle one of, of my three performances, uh, where I said to the, the tone engineer, I can't hear myself. But that was at the end of the first act. I mean, end of the, where the, where the intermission was, first act, second act, I don't, I don't know. But up to that point, I had, there was nothing I could say was there. And furthermore, I couldn't hear myself. So, and I thought they were giving her, giving her um, mic a, a boost. So I went over to her mic and sang in her mic. Now, two weeks back, you phoned the show and uh, expressed yourself on the subject of singing with someone with, uh, with insufficient volume to match yours. You said that you realize that these dynamics scaled appropriately for the Metropolitan Opera. And you commented that Milo's voice was small-scale for the role. You know, I did not say that. I was, re I was remarking to the, to the gentleman's remark. Yes. My comment came because of what he was saying about me. He said I was trying to drown her out, and that was not the case, as I said. And uh, my, my opinion then, as now, is that I have a big voice. And it is now bigger than ever. And I cannot do a thing about it if somebody who ca uh, cannot sing to, to, to match my, my volume. I cannot help it. I'd sing according to the, to the, uh, to the um, dynamic markings, bearing in, si in, in mind the size of the house in which I'm singing. And I certainly, certainly will not scale my voice down for anybody. They wouldn't do it for me, so why should I do it for them? Mm -hmm. uh, what of, oh, what of the fact that your voice is bigger? To what do you attribute that? Well, I, I really believe, last, last year I had an operation. I had um, um, a tumor removed. I didn't know I even had it floating around. And it was a six pound thing. I mean, just can you imagine walking around with six pounds of mass inside of you and that was also part of the reason why I didn't have the breath control which I had before oh. I couldn't I couldn't figure out what what the reason was I try one one moment I'd had I'd be able to hold a sustain a, 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 um, a phrase forever and the next moment I tried it and it wasn't there I just couldn't hold it and then I had this operation and uh, it took me about nine months to recuperate from that it was in, in April in May of, of last year of 85 and I do believe that since I've had this, this thing removed, that uh, my voice seems to have taken on greater size. Was that a fibroid? Yes, it was. Yeah. 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 What of Milo's Aida? You know, this is a very interesting thing. People, t people just, sort of sw just sort of wipe this under the table. But one has to remember that as ladies get older, they, they, they come into this kind, of a, this kind of a problem. And very often, I think even on the program, I heard somebody say in your program a couple of weeks ago, somebody m mentioned the fact that uh, uh, women uh, have, this, have the menopause and, and very often they have troubles with the voice. I don't know if you're sure what, or who I was talking about. Probably that may have been me. Yes, <laughs> I, I, because I have certain theories. I, I, yeah. And I think you're right. Yeah. And um, I, I feel that this sort of thing really should, should be taken into consideration because, you know, people can be very, very cruel not even knowing what, is, what, what the woman is going through. If they knew a little bit of something about what, what, she's, what, she's, what she's having to put up with, then they'd be a little, little less cruel. Now, you know, sometimes when you listen to these, these, these uh, sports programs, the tennis players and all this, they get all kinds of excuses, and nobody says a thing about it. But we can't, have a, we can't make an excuse. Uh. You're supposed to be 100% all the time. And as you know, and as everybody knows, the female body is very, very complex. I mean, it's unbelievable. And there are so many things that go to make, to make up the voice, to make the voice what it is. Sometimes you, you wonder, why is, am I singing like this? And you don't know why. Or why am I doing this? All of a sudden, you're doing something different that you never did before. Or something you did, you did a thousand years ago. And now all of a sudden, that's, that's my case, as a matter of fact. My voice now has gotten, has gotten back to that that dark, round, warm sound that I had, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and now I don't know whether it's only because of the operation or whether it's because of my, of, uh, that I'm teaching myself again, you know, 
or, or what the reason is, but be that as it may, there's a change. You had teachers in the interim? Yeah. And you've forsaken them? Oh, definitely. May I ask who they were? No, I will not tell you. Uh-huh. That's not very nice. Well, what are the differences now? What are you doing? Uh, what were you doing and what are you I, doing? I'm, I'm going, I've gone back to my, my Tocatrian and Billups way of singing. Straight, straight forward to the front of the face and not, and not making the, the voice very, very uh, bright and metallic. Simple as that. I make it very round and black. Black in... Black in color and black in... <laughs> in rays. <laughs> You declared on the telephone that you're a few months shy of 50. Yeah. And that, you, not that you look a day over 32 or oh, even I 28. Love you. I love you. I give you a kiss. Uh, and that you, uh, please, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, you're prepared to speak your mind. What of Milo's Elisabetta and Aida? I did say when I'm 50. But since I won't be here when I'm 50, I'll tell you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I heard um, Aprile Milo in the last act on, well, actually, from the Alto da Fe to the um, Tukele Vanita, because I want to hear her as well as I want to hear the, the lady who was stepping in to sing uh, uh, Eboli. And, was um, that the Italian ca Giovanna ca Casso right, uh, exactly. Casola, I think? Casola, exactly, yeah. exactly. And... Um, I, I I don't know whether I was at a disadvantage where I was standing, because I was standing back in the standing section of, on the orchestra level, because I didn't really go to hear the whole, whole performance. And sometimes you don't really hear the performance as it goes out into the rest of the house from under that overhang, you see. But from where I was standing, I would say that um, it did not ride over the orchestra, as I hear often uh, with, with a Freni, or with an Arroyo, or with a Zeno Urinat that I had many years ago, or with a, a Montserrat Caballé, who, um, uh, and I think you, you have to ride over the orchestra for, and over the chorus. Uh, for that alto da fe, in order for you, for that voice to be heard, you, 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 it has to be loud enough, it has to be strong enough, and hers was not. Now let's go on to um, to the Aida. Um, I was disappointed in, in in her first performance, but um, I was less disappointed in the second one, and I guess that's also natural, especially in view of the fact that the first one was like a dress rehearsal for her. Not, of course, bearing into mind that she had done done the rehearsals uh, in last summer. She knew the staging, and she also um, had a, had a chance to to work with um, work with us this this summer with Maestro Maestro uh, Santi. So it wasn't exactly that she was being thrown to the wolves, uh, but. The first performance, I, I do feel, I mean, I understand her point of view because when you're thrown into a, into a performance, even if, it's, even if you've rehearsed it uh, in, the, in the dressing room and rehearsed it in the, in the rehearsal hall, it's not the same as when you go on the stage. And when you have people around you with whom you don't even know how your voice is going to match. So you're kind of feeling your way. Um, and I think that's really what she was doing on that on that first night. She was feeling her way through through the Aida. Second night, I think she felt more comfortable and more assured of herself. I could see it when the, when the, when she came onto stage already. As a matter of fact, I knew then. Oh, oh, she's out for blood tonight. So Bombray gave it to her. So I gave it to her, and she gave it back to me too with her E flat. It wasn't very wasn't very big and belted out as Mr. Hanahan said, but it was there. And, and as I said before, mind you, if I had one myself, I would have given her the run for her money. But she got me on that one. <laughs> had she had uh, stage rehearsal? Yes, of course. With orchestra? No, 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 no. Who gets that these days? Yes. We didn't either. We only got one, um, uh, one stage rehearsal, and that was in, the, in, in uh, one uh, re rehearsal of, se of seven days. We only had seven days rehearsal. Had she re rehearsed the part with you? Who? Uh, me long. No. No. But, but why should she? She's a cover. Yes. What of the voice? Oh, wait, but you had performed the role together, of course, in the parks. Yes. Yes. How many times? Uh, I did only three. Three, I, three yeah. I believe, yeah. yeah. Uh, what of Milo's voice? 
what do you make of it? It's a lovely instrument. It's a lovely instrument. There's no doubt about it. And uh, I heard her sing in that concert at, at, at Carnegie Hall of E. Lombardi. Jonathan and I, no, you didn't go that day, did you? And, uh, but I think, because I, I recalled you up that evening to, to give you a report on her. And um, I thought it was very beautiful. And I said to him then that I think her voice blooms, uh, blossoms when it gets past G. Yeah. You know, the high G. Um, and from there on, I mean, it, it, it seems to just sort of float in the air. But before that, I didn't find, I didn't find the, the, the great beauty um, that she had in the top note, in the top part of yes. voice. She didn't have that in the, in the middle voice. Do you think the part of Aida, also that of Elisabetta, too, as the Italians say, centralized in tessitura to be ideal for Milo? I, no, I don't think that. I think she just has to, has to, uh, to work herself into it. You know, there's nothing like experience. You can't buy it. It's got to be worked at. And you, one has to give her time. She has to have time to, to grow. One can't, be, one can't push her into, into a role simply because there's a ne necessity out. And I think she should take the time to, um, to, to let herself develop. Because I think she could be a very, a very fine singer. And not only a fine singer, but she can even be a very fine artist. And, cause, and that is a difference. What is she like as an artist today? She's too young. She, how does, what does she know about Aida? Mm. She's very, she, mind you, she knows what she, she certainly knows what she's doing, but, but that still is not a finished artist. What, where you in life? You can't get that overnight. You don't learn that overnight. Well, what is the difference between, between knowing what you're doing and being a finished artist? Would you define, can you pin that down? Knowing what you're doing with what you now have to work with is not being an artist. I think she can develop into a very fine artist, yeah. but I don't. I don't think if you rush it, that uh, it's going to it's going to develop that way. I, I I really truly don't think so. I may be I may be wrong. Could you give us some examples? Like what? What kind of? Uh, what, well, kind of what are you looking for? Uh, could you tell us about a passage where you would say, well, she knows what she's doing? All right, I give you I give you yeah. a good example, uh, and it's not about what she's doing, but what she's doing incorrectly, and that is singing behind the beat. You cannot sing behind the beat and, and expect to be, be termed a first-rate artist. I mean, simple as that. I mean, there are some singers who are so-called uh, stars who also sing behind the beat. But they have a little bit more, more for, them, for them going uh, than, than Miss Milo has. Now, I, I think be, besides be singing behind the beat, I, I, I may be wrong, and, and, and I leave it to her, her teacher, Madame Patanet, to, to explain it, but I would think that her reason for singing behind the beat is because she's trying to beef up the sound. And in order to beef up that sound, she has to take time to do that. And in taking time, you fall behind the beat. Who are some others who sing behind the beat? I don't think that's my point to say, Jesse. Okay. How does Milo beef up the sound? And what do you mean by that, by beefing up the sound? You beef up the sound? <laughs> How do you explain it? John, do you know how to explain that? I think, I think you have to do it. You you, yeah, exactly. You're covering it. You cover it and thicken the sound. I mean, let's, for instance, let, let, let me get... No, la, 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 la. And I want to thicken that sound. I go... That's thickening the sound. Brava. But how, do you, but how do you carry that the whole evening through like that? Now, there was a barely discernible change in volume when you did that. The darker, fuller, thicker sound was ever so slightly more powerful, according to the meters here. Ever so slightly. I c I'm sure I could do also the other one, uh, uh, just as loud. My question is, does one gain in power as one darkens and thickens? I don't think so. So, in other words, uh, the gain is illusory. Singers maybe. I think... I think Yes, I think you're absolutely right. Now, often, I think when... You see, uh, the reason it, it got louder in my voice is because I have a low voice and a, and a thick voice. I mean, I, it, but let's say, let's put it a little bit higher. Maybe it might not work that way. I don't know. Wait, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for the <laughs> sheer, sheer gale of sound and we pinned out on, on the meters here. Yes, I think so. 
Shall I give it a little thicker now? Yeah, wait, wait, uh, do, do it again. I, I think I've got a good... Do, do, start afresh, I'm sorry to... Don't forget, I sang last night. Yeah. Yes, okay. All right. And which one do you want now? Uh, the, 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 the... The thinner one. The thinner, yes. Uh, you want it with volume? Yes. Uh, now you want it the other way? Yes. Beast up? Yes. Uh, yes. Now... At the peak there, we did gain three decibels in volume when when you beefed it up. Uh, also, the sound was magisterial, commanding, whereas the earlier sound was affectionate, caressing. Uh, where's uh, my friend in <laughs> 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 Um Well, you feel that Milo thickens her voice Probably with little gain in volume. She's well, I, I, I think everybody heard that. I mean, I don't, it's not for me to say. One, one has to hear with their own ears. One heard that the voice, that the voice d d did not um, have, the, have the size that, that she was trying to bring out. For those trying to phone, we'll take calls when there's music playing. There's no one here to answer phones currently. Um... Uh, what were the reactions to the comments you made to me about Milo two weeks ago on the show? What was that? Well, you said some of these same things then about her Aida. What has she been like to sing with since? You've done a couple of performances. We've only done two performances altogether. But you've done one here. performance since. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. One one performance. Was there a difference? You mentioned that she came out uh, determined to try to give you a run for your money. Yes, yes. Now, I don't know if that was her, her, her idea or not. It might well have been that she thought, well, I, I'm going to be better than I was last performance. And it and maybe, maybe came out just... Um, one interprets the way they want to interpret it. Uh -huh. But, it, it, you know, sometimes we, re we read things into a gesture that probably is, is not even there. I think she's a very serious singer. I think she has to be taken seriously, too. And I think it's, it, it's uh, uh, the, the, the critics do her a disservice, as well as, um, as the Metropolitan a disservice. Because, and when I say a disservice, because they, they begin to praise her far too lavishly and then she begins to to believe it and then when she when when she really should be there where she sh really should go because I, I think she really should should um, should grow to be really something quite special uh, it might not even be there anymore because she thinks she's so great now you see what i'm trying to yes, say yes and you they have to give her a t give her a chance to grow don't make her think that she's already a finished product she's not she has a long way to go one cannot learn it overnight. What are some things she has yet to learn? Oh, Stefan, that's, that's, that's so difficult. I cannot tell you all the things that she, that she knows or does not know. I don't know her that well. Do I've only sung with her, uh, the Aida's. I don't know. D did a couple of things leap out at you? No, because I don't pay that much attention. Mm -hmm. I have my own work to do, so I don't really pay attention to what other people yeah. are singing, unless we're singing on the stage together at that time. No examples come to mind. No, I can't no, think of anything. No, it would probably be easier if one were out in the audience. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, like was the case with the, with the Lombardi. I was sitting out in the orchestra, uh, in the auditorium, so I could hear her, you see, and then yeah. I analyzed it myself. But when I'm on the stage and then when I'm involved in a performance myself, I don't have time to think about somebody else's performance. One of the guests on the show here, Ed Rosen, says that Milo is quite weird, even drawing a mustache on her own photo. How do you find her, Grace Bumbry? I don't know, because I, I, don't, I don't have that much to do with her. As I say, I, when I go to the theater, I have my work to do. Uh, and it's not that I'm being antisocial or, or anything. I have a job to do. I don't go around from dressing room to dressing room uh, um, um, socializing. I have my job, I go on the stage, and I go home. I don't know anything about her personal and private self. How old is she? I don't know. They say, they say, I mean, she says she's 28 or 29. People tell me she's 38. I don't know how old she is. I would say she is between 30 and 35. I don't really mm. know, though. It's not for me to know. And does it, does it really matter? 
I, I don't think it does. I don't think so. Oh. I mean, I de made my debut at the Paris Opera, I think I was 23, singing the role of Amneris. But, but who cared how old you are? The main thing is that the voice is, 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 uh, is, is um, in, in place. That's what's important. Bonaldo Giotti was to have come here. You, may, I, may I go on? Yes, the, uh, yes, 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 yes. You know, I would like to hear Milo with that lovely voice that she has, that freshness of voice. I would like to hear her sing Giovanna D'Arco, for, 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 for instance. Yes. I would think she'd be wonderful in that. I would think she'd be great in, uh, in Donizetti in um, Bellini. Oh. I don't know if she had, but I think they tell me she's got a lot of, a lot of um, joie de vivre and that she's very, uh, very happy and, and can be a comedian as well. So maybe, maybe that would be the, the type of thing she could, that she would excel in. But I think the things that where there's a lot of agility, I would think she'd be absolutely great in. I really do believe well, that. Well, in Ernani, she simplified the triplets in the first act in the trio and had difficulty with the trills. She does seem to have difficulty moving her voice. I didn't find that. I didn't find that. Mind you, I didn't hear the, the Ernani, but I, in the Lombardi, I didn't, I didn't feel that at all. Mm. I found it very, I mean, really very limpid and, and easy. Mind you, did, did she have to step in at the last moment for that Ernani? Uh, she was in the second cast. But, but, but was, she, was she prepared to go on that night? Did she know in advance no, no, that she no, had no, to no. sing? I think she sang opening night, I'm mistaken. Uh, she, I'm not sure if she... Bob Conley, do you recall whether Milo had been scheduled to do opening night? Or whether she stepped in? I believe she had been scheduled. Which opening? Uh, Ernani. No, I don't remember. I don't know either. Yeah. Mm. Well, but my point I was trying to make was, if she was already prepared for it, they, if she knew in advance, then, then there's no excuse. But if, there, if, if um, she was called at the last moment, um, like the day of the performance, yeah. of course you're not, you're not ready. Perhaps you didn't really get your voice going for that. And when you, when you are covering all the time, I don't imagine that you, that you are constantly rehearsing your, uh, on a particular role. I can, I, I, I don't, I've never been a cover, so I don't know. Really? No. Uh, no. Few can say that. Well, I, yeah. I guess it did. Mind you, I'm sure that, that, that somebody will say that I, that I covered something for them, but uh, I, I never had a cover contract, no. Uh, well, do you think Milo has the breath line for, uh, for earlier styles? Donizetti, Rossini, I think Bellini? so. I think so. What do you say, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that's where it lies. Where it lies. I think so, too. With us in the studio is Jonathan, uh, Morris. He phoned in to praise Dimitrova. Uh, I believe last I May. I scratched his eyes out, too. <laughs> or was it the <laughs> May he's the my year before? Pianist, you see. <laughs> he identified himself at the time to me on the telephone as Grace Bumbry's pianist. Indeed, uh, in, uh, a forth in, in the forthcoming, uh, shortly to be available, um, uh, opera fanatic, right, that makes noise, thanks. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the shortly forthcoming opera fanatic, there is an article uh, termed, uh, titled, New York Turns Against Dimitrova. I've noticed that. And why? As as for, for, for not at all. As a result of her two Conky Hall appearances in May, the Joconda and the concert with Queller, in which she sang, among other things, excerpts from Nabucco with oh, Capuccilli. Oh. The public was disappointed and reversed itself. A year before the public extolled her, we played two Dimitrova recordings here. Most listeners love them. Then we played her new Puccini album at the time of those uh, Eve Queller concerts, and uh, the public turned against her, hmm. almost to, a, to, to, to the last listener. Anyway, Jonathan uh, Morris defended her. Hmm. What did he say? Well, well let me speak for myself. Yeah, come here. Come close to, to Number my one, I don't think that critics are the voice of the people. And normally, people will read uh, about an artist that they have not seen or heard, and they will go to the performance with those words in their mind about that particular singer. Words do not describe a singer. You have to hear a singer and see that performer. I saw Dimitrova. I saw 
of course, what she lacked as far as what I considered a, a particular kind of a voice, but I did not go there expecting a lyric soprano or a lyrical spinto type of beauty. What I wanted to see was the power, and she had that to spare. Now, oftentimes, a person will give such accolades before you hear the singer that you don't even hear what they have to offer. This, you have in your mind what some critic has so cleverly put down on paper as to make you or convince you to feel that this singer is representing. And so therefore, you are, they have misrepresented the singer. And when you go there, all you can deal with is the misrepresentation of that singer as to what, how they compare with the words that the person has written down. I do not listen to other people's opinions. I go and hear for myself. So therefore, the things that I had read about her only made me interested to see how she really sang, not what somebody had written down. So when I went to see her, I, I liked her and to a point. She gave what they needed out here. Mm -hmm. A new singer with a powerful voice, not someone with a, a promise. You know, uh, oftentimes you hear singers sing and you wonder, what is the secret? Why is there always a pianissimo when there mm -hmm. should be a forte? You know, why are they in such a secretive mood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of whom do you both feel that that should be said? That one gets a pianissimo where there should be a fortissimo? That goes back to what I'm talking about, the critics. You see, you, my opinion is my opinion. It's not a fact. And oftentimes, more than, more than not, most people give out their opinion about something as if it's a fact, and that's how it should exactly be. It's not fair for, for me to give. I could tell you. I could tell you that. Chris Bumbry, is there part of you that feels betrayed because your accompanist is saying <laughs> these things about Dimitrova? No, not really, because I know him very well, and I know that if he says something, he really means it, and he means it from his heart. I mean, I, I know this, and, and, I, and I expect mm -hmm. the truth from him, because if, I, I know that if he were to say less than the truth about another singer, he would also say the less than the truth about me, and I don't need a con an accompanist who will, who will tell me lies. In what ways do you depend on Jonathan uh, Morris and his ears? In what ways? Yes. Oh, I can't begin to tell you how many. First of all, Jonathan Morris has perfect pitch. I mean, I'm not talking about relative pitch. I'm not talking about something that, that somebody is dreaming up. He has perfect pitch. And it drives me crazy. How so? Because every time I'm a little bit off, he says, you're out of tune. You're out of tune. You're under pitch. And if he doesn't say anything, he gives a funny face. And I'm, I'm very, very alert to people's moods and, and facial expressions, mm -hmm. you know. And when I see this funny expression on his face, and I stop immediately. I mean, I just have to stop because I, know, I don't want anybody shaking their heads or making any funny faces when I'm trying to sing. And so that makes me really very, very, very aware of pitch. Now, I know that, that very often I will sing out of pitch because I, I don't sing under pitch. I have a habit of singing above the pitch. Because I have so much energy and so much cr uh, cramped energy, energy that um, I often will will push it, push the pitch a tiny bit above. Mm. Most singers will sing a bit under pitch, as, as does Martin, as does uh, Dimitrova, as the, Dim she also sings above the pitch as well. Corelli sang above the pitch also. Yep. Nielsen also above the pitch. So at least I'm in good company. You see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, Many, many uh, people think that, well, she's struggling to, to, to make the note. That's not it at all. I just have so much, uh, so much energy behind there, behind the note, that it just sort of rides a tiny bit above than, than what I really need. So, in other words, uh, Jonathan Morris's ears help you uh, sing in tune. Oh, he helps me tremendously. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Mind, you, mind you, I've always been a, a very good thing as far as uh, as far as pitch is concerned but everybody comes through a goes through a through a period where you you're a little bit under the pitch or a little bit above the pitch or something like that everybody i'm i'm no i'm no, I'm no different yeah. than, than the rest than, next, than the next person Matt, yes also i've noticed that um when come close it, to one okay, thank you. Thanks, yeah. uh, a singer with a very very large voice especially when they go to the high notes you no longer hear the accompanist or the orchestra Good because point. there's so much volume and everything in your head is ringing. That's that a very good point. Cannot, yeah. Because I notice very often in, in the opera rehearsals, 
and when, when we're on stage and I cannot hear and I often say well what don't we have any speakers here on the side of the stage so that I can hear myself and they say, but, but we can all hear we can hear fine but I can't and how can you judge yourself if you can't hear how this how it's coming coming to into your ears mm -hmm. if you can't hear you can't even hear the orchestra you can't hear yourself mm -hmm. so uh, uh, where do you how do you judge how you're singing mm -hmm. How do you two prepare music? How do I prepare music? Yes. Would you give us examples? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> <Okay>. Well, specifically. <laughs> well, well, let me let me start uh, where I where. Uh, by the way, this is begin. WKCRFM in New York, eighty-nine point nine on the dial. I'm Stefan Zucker, and I'm chatting with Grace Bumbry and Jonathan Morris. I, I, I'm sure you didn't think it'd be this this, this long an, an evening. I know I didn't. I know. <laughs> anyway, but it's very interesting. But I start, first of all, I get a piece of music. Let's say a, a song. I get a piece of music, and I get the piano, and I will play that if I can play it. I mean, it might be something so difficult I can't play it. Uh, like Strauss, uh, then I, I forget it. Charles, I put it on record for me. <laughs> but, but if it's um, Schubert, Brahms, Schumann, Fauré, I, of course, I get the piano. And I learned that, first of all, musically. Then I put the words there. But usually, the, when I started with the piano, I also learned the words at the same time. Then once I've gotten past um, uh, learning the words and I've learned the music su sufficiently, then comes the time when Jonathan comes into the picture. And he comes in, we rehearse, and by this time I, I pretty much know, maybe not quite by memory, but at least enough without, without really sticking my head the whole time in the book. And uh, so then I start to work on, in, on uh, interpretation, because I've gotten it into my voice, into my throat. Sometimes there may be some tiny changes I might want to make vocally, but um, generally speaking, uh, it's already placed by the time he comes in into the picture. But uh, once he gets to get there, then we start to work, start really working on interpretation um, uh, and balance, because with, without balance you can't interpret. Uh, could you give us an example of changes that you make vocally and what you mean by placement in this context? Um, Let's say, for instance, um, we're working now on some foray songs because we're doing a recital tour in December. And um, what's Le Secret? <coughs> There's one particular spot. No, let's, let's even do a present rêve. A present rêve. That's, e that's even more, more, a bit more difficult because you can do that in many ways. You can do a present rêve in a very uh, airy, ethereal kind of way. Or you can do it much like, like a cello. I prefer to like, do it like a cello, because I, I, I'm influenced, really, by um, Rostropovich. We went to a concert in Washington, D.C., and, and, and Rostropovich was playing A Présent Rêve. And I just fell in love the, with the way he played it. I tried to emulate that. I can't do it, of course, goes without saying, because, first of all, he has a com completely different, um, a different uh, tempo than I'm able to do because uh, an instrument it you you goes on forever without without taking a breath and uh, but the basic feeling is is that of 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 uh, of a cello of of uh, rather than a violin you see what i mean say it Come well uh, what i closer. learned a lot uh, about working on these songs because you know we have different interpretations and uh, by interpretations, I don't mean nuance, because at one time I was thinking that if you had a lot of nuance, you had an interpretation, mm -hmm. which is not an interpretation, you know. Uh, the nuance comes because of an interpretation and is not an end unto itself. And oftentimes we psychologically go into how we would be in a particular mood to think of a présent rêve after the dream. What had gone on? What is the sequence? What attitude? What physical? state you would be in. I mean, even in a, a stance, we've even discussed, this on, for example, on Morgan, mm -hmm. how we thought of that, uh, an experience in your life that you, this is a continuation of whether it's being in the middle of that experience or whatever, and that's how we start to build our interpretations, which is very interesting mm -hmm. it's, it's, and very difficult and very revealing. <laughs> <laughs> do exam further examples come to mind? Do, how do you stand for Morgan, Strauss's Morgan? Und morgen wird die Sonne wieder scheinen. You can take, for an example, just a, um, 
uh, if you want to take it as a lover or as a death. But, but excuse me, it's not just the words, because he has already a prelude of um, 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 uh, two or three measures, mm. which sets the mood. So he's got to already have the, the, the mood of the song already in his mind when he plays, plays that first, I think it's a D, isn't it? Uh, which, yeah. Whichever key we do it in, I forget now. So whichever the first note is, he's got to have that already in his mind because he's got to set me up for my, for, for my uh -huh. mood. And we can't really reveal our No, we don't, give, we don't give all of our secrets away. <laughs> we work very hard on that. Nothing. You have to hear us. Well, <laughs> will that be possible in the New York area? No, not this year, no. Alas. Um, last week, Bonaldo Giotti was scheduled to come here and perform and talk. His wife called me the day before saying that he had a vocal problem acquired in the Midwest. Uh, everyone was disappointed. You and spoke... Was I, yeah. <laughs> virus volante. <laughs> a a flying, flying virus. Which took them three, three days to get over, so it was very, really flying fast. But be that as it may, I mean, I can understand it, because I've had a, a virus volante myself <laughs> any number of times. But uh, I usually get it when I'm on the, uh, let's say, in, in some seaport or something like that. But certainly not in New York City. <laughs> Should we go on to the Salome? Good idea. I'm sure the listeners are worried when the, the, the next piece of music is coming on. Side, Side three, three. Yes. right. Are there things that we should know? Well, I think they all know the opera of Salome. It, yes. it, this, is, this is the final scene. Um, it's shortly after... Well, well, no, the head, the, she has the head already in her, in her mm -hmm. hands at this point. You were saying earlier, for anyone who may have tuned in since, that this was the first time you sang, or that Salome was the first soprano role you undertook. That I did intentionally. That was yes. what I was looking for, absichtly. Intentionally, yeah. Did scream at the end as they crushed you to I death? I rather think so. It hurt being beneath all those what shields. Carry on. Yeah. Salome, Grace Bumbry. I'm privileged to have her as my guest, also her distinguished pianist, Jonathan Morris. Uh, listener comments. Charles Hay of Hempstead, New York. I heard a rumor that the Met had bought you out, Stefan, and that they would sue you if you put out Opera Fanatic. Is that true? The only uh, defense against libel is the truth. Um, well, maybe I should play a call on my answering machine just before the show on the same subject. Uh, here, and then we'll pass on to other matters. Alan Burns at the Insonia. I hear a nasty rumor that your magazine is not going to come out. Some character walked in here and said the men had brought you out not to uh, publish the Aprile Milo article. Could you clarify for that? Because people are starting to panic. Seven two four. The magazine is at the printer. <laughs> uh, it'll be in the mail in just a few days. Uh, Charles Hay of Hampstead asked further. Uh, oh, one wonders about rumor in the context of this kind of rumor, which has no foundation whatever. No one has offered to buy me out. One wonders about all kinds of rumors, rumors about Jimmy Levine and so on. Um, oh, do tell. I'm all ears. Well, uh, there are many rumors afoot that have never been been pinned down, and maybe they're true and maybe not, and uh, people just start saying all kinds of things. Um, would you <coughs> care to, to, to expand on that? No, I'm listening. I'm, I don't know a thing you're talking about. I'm, I'm completely stifled here, having a clue. Hmm. Uh, Charles Hay continued. Milo sounds small. You're not going to help me at all? Oh. I well. really don't know a thing. I'm, I tell you, I'm, I'm the most uninformed person around the Met. I don't know a thing. There are so many r rumors, Grace Bumbry, that one is at a loss where to begin. Uh, <laughs> for example, on the subject of Levine, does he smoke cigarettes? Oh, come on. I, I never heard such a question before. Does he? 
I don't know. There I know are he wears rumors. A red, I know he wears a, a, a red towel over his shoulder, but that's all I know. Does he usually show up with the red towel? Usually. Well, then that at least is fact and not rumor. <laughs> Charles Hay of Hempstead, New York. Milo sounds small in the Met. It always seems to me when I hear singers who beef up their voices that they sound small in a room, but the voice, the large in a room, but the voices don't carry in a big hall. Uh, Aprile fell on her face at the Aida's. Grace sang the pants off of Amneris. Yet Zachariasen in the news poo pooed her calling Milos the greatest Aida in the history of the Met. Uh, a friend called me and asked, what do the following sopranos have in common? Nordica, Destin, Muzio, Cinia Poncel, Tebaldi, Milnov, Price, Arroyo. They all sang worse Aidas than Milos. Oh, that mean and nasty. Uh, you're, you're speaking of Charles Hay. I don't his, know who his it comment. is. His yes. comment, yes. not very nice. Stefan Lilia Nordica? Did he ever sing, hear her sing? Uh, is he that old? Presumably not, but she did record, of course. No, you don't. No, good for you. Uh, Stefan Blecker of New York City. Bumbry is one of the last of the true divas bringing passion and glamour to the stage. At the October 16th, Aida Bumbry blew Little Miss Milo away. Charlie Handelman. Uh, Bumbry is a fascinating guest, I think, and this is a magnificent program. She is outspoken in a very exciting way. I engineered the Joconda. Now, Johnny Handelman is a tape pirate, but I was under the impression, Grace Bumbry, that uh, that your tapes come from one of Charlie Handelman's rivals, indeed his arch rival. You know, the tapes that I have come from many people. As a matter of fact, I make a lot of them myself, and I have people sitting in the orchestra who make them in, in rehearsals who make them for me. So I don't know who's uh, who's I'm playing. I don't write down who. Who well, engineered what? We often play Char Charlie Handelman's tapes here. Charlie Handelman? Yeah. I don't think I got anything from Charlie Handelman, not to my knowledge. I'm, they might well be, though. With so pirates, forgive me, one Charlie. never knows. Um, anyway, Mr. Handelman <laughs> continues. Uh, we read of insane productions in Europe. Has Grace Bumbry turned down any or tried to overthrow directors who make travesties of opera? Let me think now. Well, there's been that awful Aida there in Frankfurt, of course, which I refuse to do. And, um, can you think of anything, Jonathan? Why did you refuse to do well, it? Well, because it's so obnoxious. And can you imagine Aida going around with the dust cloth, uh, cleaning up uh, the palace? <laughs> I can't. And then there was a production of, uh, of uh, Norma in Bonn, who, who, I who's believe. Who's the director for that, for the Aida? I don't remember. I rather think it's Neus Neunfeld, but I'm, I might be mistaken. Uh -huh. I don't remember for sure. And uh, the, 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 uh, the Norma in, in Bonn, where Norma comes in on a, on a big truck, a big uh, jeep. No, I know it's a truck, actually. And she has uh, big, big, um, what do you call those things? Uh, no, what, what are those things? Uh, those big um, machine guns. On her, on, yeah. her, on her body, and she wears bad, um, fatigues. I mean, that's that's not normal. I don't I don't involve myself in things like that. I really don't. No. Uh, whose production was that? I don't remember. Yeah. Um. Tannhäuser in Frankfurt. Tannhäuser in Frankfurt. Tannhäuser where they walk through the water. And all but that, that wasn't so bad, though. Ridiculous. That wasn't so bad. But the one I I I, I dislike most, I think, was the Macbeth that was done in in, in Frankfurt. Uh, it was Frankfurt. Frankfurt where she um, lies in bed uh, there. I think she has three young men in bed with her. And then there's this, and, and I, oh, it's one thing after the other. She has this yellow, this um, leather skirt and some long boots. And oh, it was just, just dreadful. I hated every moment of it. I did one performance and that was it. I said, I cannot do any more. Sorry about that. What, uh, why did you detest it so? Because it's not, it, it is, it's not what, what uh, neither Verdi nor Shakespeare w wanted. And, and certainly not what I wanted. Who was the director? 
Again, I don't remember. I, I liked it for... Oh, no, that was Neufeld. That was, uh -huh. was my first uh, my first experience with Neuf Neuenfeld. I think his name was Neuenfeld. How do you spell that? N-E-U-N... I think it's N-E-U-N-F-E-L-D, if I'm not mistaken. Yolanda Catapano. I've seen Grace Bumbry in everything she's done at the Met and the New York City Opera. The role that impressed me most was Amnervis. Mm -hmm. Her performance on September 26th was truly brilliant, calling to mind Bruna Castagna in that role years ago. Ronald Kidney. Of oh, by the way, is Castagna in any way an influence? No, nope. never even heard her. Uh, are there influences? Models? No. Nope. Self, you're self-creating. <laughs> Mm. Uh, no influences. Unless it's Lotte Lehmann, that's about all. Yeah. No, no. Can you point to Lehmann's influences, if any? No, I can't point to any, no, because um, she brought, brought out uh, in me what you see today. Ronald Kidney of Queens, I enjoy the show. It's fascinating to hear an artist of Bunbury's stature appraise a younger artist such as Milo. I agree, the critics put a strain on Milo, who is not yet a finished artist. She will be an important Verdi singer, but she's still learning. Brava, Bumbry. You know, I, I think they all make an enormous mistake. Why do they have to insist that she's going to be a Verdi singer? Let her just become a singer. Mm. Why must they put a, a, a label onto her? Give her a chance to go into what she's going to be, but don't force any, any certain label. Let her learn what she wants to do. She's too, it's too early to know what, where she's going to be. How did I know I was going to be a soprano? How? Uh -huh. I never would have known this 20 years ago. I never thought about it. The, all I wanted to do was sing the best I could. Let her sing the best she can, and she'll find her own little niche. Barbara Travers, what a warm and charming woman Grace Bumbry is. Did she study with Lehmann before or after this Zalome? I seem to hear Lehmann's influence. I studied with Lehmann before. Before. Did Lehmann play a part in shaping in Salome? this? Yes. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, she was well against me singing Salome. And I converted her, as a matter of fact, because she didn't want me to sing the, the soprano repertoire at all. How come? But she, heard this, the, she heard this dark, warm voice of mine. And that is what, what uh, impressed her most. I recall, as a matter of fact, um, when I sang the Odon Fatale, I had to learn that, of course, for one of her master classes in, in Santa Barbara. And she always wanted me to sing it in the transposed key, which was a transpose a third lower than the original key. And she, because she liked to hear that middle section, O Mia Regina, sung very low and cello-like, you see. Yeah. And um, it was Tokatian who says, no, you must learn it also in the original key because you will need that one day. But Lehmann, she, she just didn't hear my voice in a, higher, in a higher key, even though I remember rather well there were some soprano singers who were supposed to, so soprano, quote unquote, who were in the class who were singing certain pieces, and I sang them also. And I sang them better than they did. And I then began to wonder, well, who with what? I mean, am I a mezzo, or, 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 or am I a soprano, or are they a mezzo, or what? The me and I, I always said then that the thing you have to do is find what fits your voice. Don't put any labels onto yourself. Just do what you have to do and what you can do well. Peter Ransman of New York City. I'm a great Bumbry fan. You've Why a lot of them out there, haven't you? <laughs> oh, indeed. Why not Isolde, Brunhilde, the dyer's wife? We'd love to hear her in those German roles. You know, this is very interesting, this man. This is a man, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. He uh, said that Peter before, Ransman. As a matter of fact, Thomas Schiffers, before he died, well before he died, wanted me to do Isolde with Domingo as, um, as Tristan. I don't remember the man's name. <laughs> as Tristan. And I think, actually, that was far too early. As the Germans said, viel verfrüht. <laughs> and um, because it was not uh, the right time for me, nor for Domingo. So I have not done um, it uh, at, at all. Now, whether Domingo has yet or not, I don't know. 
Um, then uh, I don't what, think what so. Would, no. Pardon me. Tristan? No, I don't think he said. I don't. I don't no. think so. What are the other two things he said? Uh, Dyer's wife. Now that's very uh, interesting because I remember years ago when they did the new production of. Um, Die Frau ohne Schatten, Mr. Bing asked me, would I do The Dyer's Wife? And I said, oh, no, Mr. Bing, I don't want to sing that thing because I'm so tired of singing roles with, 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 with um, raggedy clothes. I'm fed up. And so he says, oh, you'll be great in it. I said, I don't care how great I'll be. I'm tired of those rags. And so I didn't sing. I never even learned it till now. But I have been asked, and as a matter of fact, this summer, I was in, in Orange. We were doing Tannhäuser with Leonie Re Rizonek. And um, Leonie, as you know, is very competitive. And I love her. I mean, I really love her. And um, uh, so we, we were vocalizing in our dressing room, in mine, and she dressed and vocalized in her dressing room. And so at one point, I had, I had made this, this high note, and I sustained high note. And she came running to my room. Chris! I see. I said, yes, I know. I have lots of them. She says, I, I hate you. I said, well, I hate you too. She said, well, you know, that's how, that's how we, 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 we divas are. You know, the star singers are always like that. We always hate each other, but we love each other too. She said, but you know, Grace, Grace, they call me Grace, you know, in, in, in Vienna. Grace, what you should do is you should sing The Dyer's Wife and you should sing also Kundry. I said, but Leonie, I can't sing, I cannot sing, um, Kundry? She said, but, you, but my dear, you have the top, you have the bottom, you have the pianissimi, you're very much like my voice, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, Leonie, yeah, but you say, you, you sing the, the sing Kundry. She says, no, darling, but you see, I'm giving it up now. I pass it on to you now. <laughs> 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 so I might eventually do the Dyer's Wife and Kundry. You never know. <laughs> I love her. I really do. <laughs> Special woman. Robert, Marty, for those trying to phone again, we cannot take calls uh, until there is music playing. There's no one here to do that. <laughs> Robert Marino, Franklin Lakes. Uh, in Bunbury is an invigorating guest. Thank God there are some large voices left. Jonathan Brown. What of Martina Arroyo? She cracked during the October 11th Patria Mia. Santi went right on with the music, not waiting. Has Arroyo been having problems? Well, I, I don't know if she's been having them or not. I, that's not for me to know. But uh, if somebody cracks on a note, certainly one has a problem. That's obvious. Now, whether it was a momentary thing or whether it was, it's something that, that, that has set in, uh, some problem that has set in or, or the, the, this, this last time, I don't know. I can only go by what I've heard, and that's only this, this been these, these last performances of, of Aida. What was and, and that Santi went on ahead, I mean, was, he was certainly right. One certainly can't stop there and make a, a pregnant pause. And, I mean, you can't do that. You have to go on, otherwise it looks too obvious what has happened. What is your assessment of Arroyo's Aida, and how does it compare with Milo's? Well, it's, it's still a, a, a very a f a fine voice, I mean, and, an, and an important voice, for sure. Um, I don't think that, again, I don't think that I'm, I'm the person to say, because, uh, as I told you before, I don't really hear, hear the other singers. I'm too busy with what I have to, what I have to do. When I have to sing, I, 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 I'm on stage singing. When I'm off stage, I'm concentrating on, on my next scene. So I don't really listen to those ladies over the loudspeaker. I, I, I don't have the time. Was it the high C on which a royal cracked? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I heard that only because I was on my, on making my way back to the dressing room. So I don't, I, other than that, I, I wouldn't have heard. You heard it on the speakers then? On my way coming yeah. from the stage onto my dressing room over the loudspeaker. Jim Burgess, I love Grace Bumbry, a fascinating woman with a fascinating life and fascinating career. Thank you. Uh, what of Magda Olivero? Well, Magda Olivero was somebody very, very special. I mean, she's still alive, <laughs> for sure, but she's no longer singing, I don't believe, is she? Uh, apparently not. I don't think so, but that's why I said uh, was. She was a very special singer in, in that, um, I, I think she was really more an actress than a singer. I think she was an actress who also sang, is that kind of, if I put it that way. Because everything she did was, was a theatrical masterpiece. I remember 
having seen her over in New Jersey, she was singing Fedora. And I never liked that part. I mean, I just, just never, ever liked it. I had, been, I had been asked a number of times to sing Fedora. And I said, oh, no, that's, that's really the tennis part. And then until I saw Magda Olivero do it. And I saw what it could become. I mean, it was really, it was really a wonderful piece of Verismo music and a, and a piece of um, Verismo theater that she, that she showed us. And the same thing was true in the, um, in the Yenufa we did in, in La Scala together. I was, I was really very fortunate to be able to watch her because you learned an awful lot. And, you know, th a lot of people don't like to learn. They want to be already, you know, just uh, fully formed by, <laughs> by Zeus and that's it. Uh, but you don't you don't come that way. You have to you have to absorb things that people that people do. Sometimes you can even learn what they don't do well. You see, and and learn not to do it. But with Magda, that wasn't the case. You 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 saw this person go on stage. You saw her not only on stage. You saw her backstage. You saw how she prepared herself for the role. You saw how she got into the mood. There was no there was no um, how, what do you call it um, stupidogeny. Little stupidities. Little stu stupidities yeah. backstage. It was a serious thing. You got onto, you got into the into the atmosphere the moment you got into that theater. How and did she? Yes. How did she do that? Uh, you you, you saw it. She wasn't. She there was no time for little, for for small fry stuff. You go into there with a with a, um, um, a, a oneness of um, of thought, and um, and I think I'm very much like her in that I have a what I call a one track mind. That's why I, when you ask me about uh -huh. my, my colleagues, what they do or when I'm not on stage, I haven't a clue. And, and I think I learned this early on. I remember a girlfriend of mine was, uh, was uh, in California, well, she's from California, but she was in Salzburg, and she was in Salzburg a year before I was. She was just there really just watching, watching. She was not a singer. But she said to me one thing, you know, Grace, what you have to learn is not to get involved with any of that backstage uh, tomfoolery because it takes away from your concentration. And she was absolutely right. And the moment you let yourself become, become too stricken with from all, from, from all sides, just torn from here and there and yon, you can't possibly come and bring, bring a wonderful performance on, on the stage. Your mind is somewhere else. You're not really with what you have to do. Can you imagine a doctor going, on, going to a, a surgeon, going to a, an operation, with, uh, fooling about before he got on, before he went into the operation? I don't think he could do that. Do you recall details that you learned from Magda? I didn't learn anything from Magda as for, that I could use for, my, for uh -huh. my performance, but what I could use for my, for my profession is what I learned. A bearing. I, yeah. yeah. You, how, how you, pro, how you um, perform on stage, how you carry yourself on stage and off stage. And I th but you know, it's, either, it's something you have inborn or you don't. And, it, and, and, and even the interest itself is, is either inborn or it's not. What do you mean by the interest? The interest in wanting to 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 yes. to to be the best you can be. <clears throat> WKCRFM in New York. Should we play more? Yes. How about um, the sleepwalking scene of Salo of uh, <laughs> of, Salome, of Macbeth, side A. That should uh, be spot. My guests it are Grace fun. Bumbry and Jonathan Morris. I'm Stefan Zucker. Brava diva. Uh, thank you. Uh, Grace Bumbry, my guest here on WKCR, opera fanatic, Macbeth. We'll be hearing more in a very short while. Uh, listener comments. Charles Hay, uh, he called earlier with respect to the comparison between Milo and Nordica and Chini and Desk and Boncel. I was being facetious. Oh. in comparing Milo to Nordica, and I was by no means being disrespectful to the older singers. Thank you. Uh, and he certainly, uh, well, I think <laughs> that explains it. Uh, Lillian Anton of New York City. Stefan, you're conducting a wonderful interview. I'm eating it all up. Uh, I'm going to see Grace Bumpery Monday in Aida. Ask her to compare Callis and Tibaldi along the same lines. Uh, uh, Frank Kopik, of, also of New York City, called to ask, was Callis an influence on you, Grace Bumbry? 
Well, I never saw Carlos on stage, but uh, I have many, many of her records, and I am, and I, I must say that I do very much enjoy what she did. Um, from the point of view of uh, expression and the observance of the dynamic markings and the uh, observance of uh, um, rhythms and, uh, um, and uh, what do you call it, um, uh, tempi, uh, and the emphasis on the words. I mean, of course, those things are very important to me. But uh, as far as, as the proper influence is concerned, I don't think so, because we, we certainly sing differently and uh, d two different types and two different approaches to, to, to uh, singing. But I think what we do have in common is the, is the, the great respect for music and, <coughs> excuse me, and the respect for what the composers wrote. Uh, and you see this when, we, when you see that we both try to serve the, uh, the composer and what he put down on, on paper. Uh, what of Carlos versus Tibaldi? That's very difficult because, uh, you know, it's uh, like comparing ice cream to candy. They're both very sweet, aren't they? Um, I think perhaps uh, Carlos was uh, more diversified than, than Tibaldi was because she, she did almost the entire gamut, the entire um, spectrum of, uh, of, of uh, the female range and repertoire, um, whereas Tabaldi, I, I think, was more limited in, 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 what she, in what she did. She did the, mo the more lyrical things, and I think she basically concentrated on the lyrical, lyrical line. Carlos had a, had a color, well, my goodness, she's a dramatic, a lyrical, spinto, coloratura, uh, dramatico, she was, she was so many, many different, different uh, voices. And I think it's unfair to even try to compare the two. You take them for what, for what they are. Madame uh, Carlos was what she was, and, and Madame Tibaldi certainly was what she was, and they both were equally great in what they did. Just enjoy them. Maybe I should say, regarding listener comments, that uh, they may be published in Opera Fanatic magazine. I'm hoping to transcribe tonight's interview. And uh, the listener comments are subject to editing for clarity and brevity. Uh, Howard Hart, Grace Bunbury is fabulous. Grace goes to everything, hears everything. I go to many performances myself, Howard added, and always find Grace in attendance. Uh, so you're an opera goer. No, I'm not really. No, I go to <laughs> orchestral concerts more than I go to the opera. Really? But uh, from time to time, I will go to a performance of, of another singer. Like last week, I went to hear Eva Marton in uh, Tosca, and uh, the Saturday afternoon, I think it was. I think that's probably the only opera I've heard this year outside of my own performances. Um, I can't think of anything else, but if there's something that, that's really interesting that... that that belongs to my repertoire. Oh, no, mind you, Lombardi is certainly not my repertoire, is it? But I went because I, 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 like, I like going to concerts when I get a chance. What did you make of Marton's Tosca? I found it rather cold. Mm. I didn't find that the voice was, uh, dr was dramatic enough for me, uh, dramatic in the Italian sense. It, it didn't give me enough warmth. Um, I, I don't think even her, her body movements were sufficient sufficiently dramatic for me I I, th I thought what she did in the in the um, in the second act in the, in the VC Darcy was quite the quite nice how she how she did it took it from the from uh, from a prone pr 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 position but for my taste there wasn't enough drama in what she did Howard Hart wrote the Scorto discography for her autobiography Scotto, Howard continued, omitted a large man's name. How do you, Grace Bunbury, feel about that? I didn't read the book. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, Scotto didn't name Pavarotti. Oh. Caroline... Oh, they had a big argument. Didn't they have a big fight or something? So I understand. Out in San Francisco? Maybe she has reason not to, not to, uh, to uh, include him. Caroline Jensen of Brooklyn... 
Bunbury is the diva of yesterday. Caroline, my friend Caroline. Sorry. <laughs> Bunbury is the diva of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, Carl Davis. Oh, he, uh, is that all she has to say? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Carl Davis is in hospital. Um, we all wish him well. Long time listener, lovely gentleman. The Bunbury Show is the best medicine. Oh, I've seen, nice. uh, I've heard, I've seen her since her second performance at the Met, and have loved it all. Though her Aduchena was too sexy. Bunbury is Felix Kulpa. And who? A happy fault, <laughs> Felix Kulpa. Um, she's underappreciated in the U.S. She's always thrilled me, and I'm sure always will. George Stevenson of Woodside. Bumby is a fabulous guest. For a while, she used the name Grace Meltzer Bumbry. And he wonders about that. It's my mother's first name. And my mother was all, it is, and, and always has been very, very supportive. And I thought that when I made the, the, the switch from the mezzo-soprano to the soprano repertoire, just to make a bit of a difference, uh, I would give my mother a bit of credit, and I put her name in there, because she, because she would have been a singer herself had she, ha had she had the opportunity. But her mother, at the last moment, uh, decided she wouldn't go away to, couldn't go away to college, so she was there. Couldn't wait, wouldn't go away to, uh, to study music, so... Did you study with your mother? No. Uh, Mr. Stevenson continues, did Grace Bunbury ever sing with Scotto? And does she like her as an artist? What should I sing with Scotto? I can't imagine what. Did I ever? I don't think so. And Again, that's a, that. You see, you have to think about, about the casting. I mean, I have a big, heavy, dramatic voice. What would I sing with Scotto? What do you make of Scotto? I think she's a, she's a, um, she is an artist. She is an artist. You see what I'm talking about, what I said before about singers and artists? Uh -huh. That woman is an artist. Whether you like her voice or not, she is an artist. She might have been or originally just a singer, but she has, she has developed over the years into a very, very serious artist. What of the voice? Well, it's not the voice that, that it was. I remember years ago when she sang, um, she sang Butterfly in, in Chicago. It was uh, abs absolutely something incredible. I mean, it was so, so believable. I mean, the, the tears were just running down my face um, at, the, at the death scene there. And not only that, the way she moved, the things that she did, uh, the, also the, um, the, the sweetness of the, of, of the bitter sweetness of the, of the voice. Uh, which was was so convincing for um, for that for that role, and not only butterfly, but it's, I I say butterfly mainly because that was the thing that impressed me most about Renato Scotto. That was the main thing I I, I really adored about her. It's mm -hmm. not my type of voice. It's not the voice that 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 goes straight to my heart. I need a warmer sound than that, that to to really set my my temperature high higher than <laughs> than necessary. But um, be that as it may. What she does, she does it with, uh, with, with great uh, interest, w w with all of her being, and uh, you know that she's thought it out. And as, as, as does, like for instance, Madame, Madame um, Olivero. It's the, same, it's the same school. It's the same school where these people are serious about what they do. You don't have to like their voice. Nobody asks you to like it. Nobody, somebody's gonna like it whether you like it or not. And um, what she does and what she did with that voice, uh, I think it was really quite remarkable. Mr. Stevenson concluded, Nell Rankin called Bunbury the St. Louis woman when Rankin covered for her. <laughs> Does that ring any bells? Not particularly. I think I, I canceled midstream, I think, uh, uh, Don Carlos, didn't I? Or um, I'm near it? Don Carlos. Don Carlos. And she sang for me, yes. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I think Helen Trouble was a St. Louis woman. <laughs> Uh, you're from St. Louis? Yes. Uh, do you go back there often? Oh, sure. My parents still live there, so I must go back to see them. My father will be 90 in February. My mother will be 83 in, in uh, July. So I have to go to see them as long as I have them. Do they, do they have much sense of who you are in, uh, back home outside of the family? Oh, 
sure, sure. But sometimes, of course, I'm still I'm still the little the little girl, you know, the little Gracie. <laughs> but that's all right. That's all right. Well, are they? That's how it should be. Are they still com comfortable with you back home? Oh sure. Sometimes too comfortable for my comfort. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Do you? Do you I prefer to have sometimes a little bit more respect, if you know what I mean. What do, <laughs> what they do? Say, fooey, fooey on that respect. <laughs> what do they do? Oh, they just, in fact, the thing that, that really mm. makes me mad is my mother always invites somebody over. More than one somebody, like that, three or four ladies coming over, you know, just to see little Gracie. Little Gracie, uh, like she has nothing else to do but come down and entertain her friends. And I always go running off. I go up to upstairs to my part of the house, and I stay there. And then she, of course, she gets furious because I don't come down and say hello to her friends. But that's all right. That's how mothers are. <laughs> and she's very proud of me, and that's and that's understandable. But I, it gets tiring after a bit. You know, I don't mind if, if let's say, um, for ten minutes or so, I see some of her lady friends, and and I go on. But she wants me to sit down there and have a long, drawn-out conversation about their everyday activities. I don't, I don't know what their everyday activities are. I have my life and my lifestyle, and, 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 and I, don't, I don't understand what they're talking about all the time. Is she showing you off? Of course. I tell you, like the, the, the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> well, with reason. <laughs> Kia what of? Ah. Yeah, purr, 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 purr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorites. He and um, and uh, Paul Plischka, James Morris, those are, and and Bernardo Giotti, those are my favorite bases. And and you, do you? But you see, there's a, there's something communal in there, don't you see that? that they all have big, beautiful, luscious voices, luscious, big. That's what I like. Mm -hmm. That really sets my heart throbbing. Luscious, big. Not something small and. Insignificant. Insignificante. Like? I, no, no, so. I don't know. Just, just, just take what I said. Franey. Ah, that's a beautiful singer. Now, you see, now, we were talking before about black voices. That is the closest to a black voice that I know from a white singer. How so? But you must hear that in that. It, it, uh, there's this, this special, there's a, an extra quality in there. I often say that I think somebody must have been visiting there during the war times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vickers. Very wonderful arti um, artist. Great artist. Great artist. Again, a kind of voice uh, in the category of uh, Madame Olivero. You know, it's not, not uh, that's a bit of exaggeration, but mo he's more actor than singer. It's a, mm. what I find an actor who sings. Mm. I think John Vickers is just a cat's meow, when, especially when he, he does a role like um, Samson and even Don Jose. You might not like his vocal, his vocal um, style, it might not be what, you look, what, you, what you're looking for, but for me, uh, as his partner, I get, I get everything I want back from him. I remember once we were, you know, John Vickers and I never, never were good friends up until, oh, we had a big fight about something, I've forgotten what. But we had been singing together for years and years, and we just couldn't stand each other. But then one day, we decided, no, I know what happened. We were in Chicago, and we were doing, we were rehearsing uh, Samson and Delilah. And I was sitting in a chair in this, in this rehearsal room, and we were having a, a little argument back and forth about who's who's right, you know, the typical singer's argument. And John Vickers came up over to my chair, and he lifted me up, chair in, and all, me in, in that chair, in one hand, <coughs> up in the air, up above his head. And from that moment, I had the greatest respect for John Vickers. <laughs> I decided, no, no, anybody who can do that deserves all my respect. And so, I mean, it, I think it broke the, the ice, you see, because I think we just thought our, our personalities just didn't, didn't jibe. They just clashed all hmm. the time. I think we both had, we were very headstrong. And, but the moment, the moment we, ha we got past that through this, this big, um, this big physical thing there, 
all of a sudden, it, he, I turned out to be a little lamb, and he was the big giant, you know. I think that's what he wanted. He liked to have women you, who were submissive, and so I became very submissive. And, and now we get along very well. You didn't feel menaced? No. Not huh. anymore. <laughs> I did then, though. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine being lifted in a chair? In a chair with one hand, I'm telling you. I don't mean being lifted with two hands in a big chair. Above his head. How did you react at the time? I was speechless. I was just speechless. My eyes popped open, and I thought, gee. Was it there and, th and then that you became friends? Absolutely. <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> <laughs> How would, you, how would you clashed before? Oh, I don't know. I think it was just that each one of us wanted to, to have the last word. Mm. Each one wanted to have their, their position, you know, in, whether in the hierarchy of the singers or whether it was on stage or in, in the staging. You wanted to have the, the favorite spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always had an argument. Each one was trying to trying to influence the other. That this was how it's, and this was the, the spot that was best for for, for you, Grace, and this is best for you, John. You know, huh. <laughs> upstaging each other. <laughs> in other words. <laughs> but but John Vickers, you can't upstage him. You cannot upstage him. Do you recall? I, but uh, imagine I never tried to anyway because I, that's not my that's not my cup of tea. Do you recall the particular run-in that you had? Not particular. There were so many. I can't remember. They all sort of mm -hmm. run together, you know. I don't remember really now. You've brought quite a bit to play, and if we don't air some of it, we'll have difficulty getting it in. Uh, w whither? What? What should we go to next? Well, I think. Can I get my Macbeth back? Uh, uh, um, I have a good idea. Why don't we play? <coughs> The uh, aria from Nabucco. Uh, this is also a pirate uh, that we, my friends, stole from the Paris Opera, as well as from the City Opera. And it might be a good idea if we compare the two. Mm -hmm. All right. And let's see what we do first. Now, may I say something here? Now, I'm sure your your audience will be delighted to hear this. <laughs> In Paris. In, I think, 1978 or 7, 77 or 78, I canceled, actually, it wasn't Paris. I, it was in Aix-en-Provence. I canceled Roberta de Verreux, I believe it was. And, you know, in, in France, it's like uh, an affront if you make a cancellation. It's almost like a crime. And so my cancellation was not forgiven. I mean, it was not even accepted. As a matter of fact, I was even sued. <laughs> and I made an appeal, and, and I still lost my appeal. But be that as it may, the French still had it in for me. So when I came a year or two later to sing, I think it was the following year, actually, to sing in Nabucco, they had their guns out. There were certain ones out there who just weren't, just weren't ready for me. They had their guns aimed at Bunbury, and they were going to get me. So you'll hear at the end of this of this aria, you'll hear the reaction of those who were against me and those who were for me. Why did, why did you cancel? I had a bad back, which I very often get, as a matter of fact. I had it here at the Metropolitan also. You know, when you have these reg stages, it's not very good for the back. Yes. And I evidently have, um, from birth, a bad um, uh, lower spine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, rather than going off to Paris, going off to France, doing um, rehearsals for an opera, having this bad back, I would just cancel that. And I had, but I made a mistake in observing a contract that I had with the, with the Cleveland um, Symphony, yeah. with Mazel. And I did, I think it was... Um, what was that? I think it was the last scene of Salome, I believe. And, um, a perfido. A perfido, yeah. And, um, so, and as it happened, when I got this bad, this bad back, it was like a day or two before. And I, and they couldn't find anybody at the last moment. So I said, good, I'll, I'll just go there. Just sit standing up anyway. It's not like walking up and down some ramps and going to rehearsals and, and, and that sort of thing. So I did that, that concert. 
And the news got around that Bombay had done a concert and, uh, at an, and the next day had canceled Aix-en-Provence. And I should have been in, in Aix-en-Provence on that night, that day, which was, let's say, that was, I sang on the 8th. I should have been in Aix-en-Provence on the 9th. I canceled on the 9th for the rehearsal. They had sufficient time to find another singer. But in Cleveland, they didn't have time to find another singer. That's the only reason I observed that contract. Wait, you canceled on one day's notice and feel that they had sufficient time? Sure, they had two weeks. Maybe I've not gotten the chronology You go into straight. a rehearsal period. Right, I see. For the performance, yes. they had, yeah. And they had two weeks or, 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 um, or close to three weeks to find somebody, and th which they did. But uh, they decided that, that I, I just didn't, I was, was not respecting um, them, and they wanted to teach me a thing or two. And you lost. I lost. I won't tell you how much, but I lost. How, co how come? And it was quite sizable. Mm. How come? They wouldn't, obs they wouldn't observe um, or recognize the, the, the doctor's certificate, which I had, of course. And, um, but they said that uh, the Bronx, that I went to the Bronx, to the, the, the well, how do you put it, to the, the most miserable part of, of, of New York, to this doctor, who the Metropolitan sent me to, of course, Dr. Doctor, doctor Perotta, who's now dead. But um, they sent me to Dr. Perotta. Dr. Perotta gave me a, a per perfectly fine um, um, health certificate, um, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't recognize it. They simply said Excuse no. Excuse me, I believe that uh, Dr. Perotta's son is a regular listener. And really? And is frequently called here, uh, oh, yes, great. himself a doctor. He was a wonderful doctor. He was a wonderful doctor. But they just didn't believe me. And mm. they didn't believe him. So there you are. Anyway, I lost my, 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 qu my case. And, and, and then they, on top of that, besides me having lost the case, they had to punish me then with, with, um, with uh, treating me the way they did at, at, at the performance of, of Nabucco in Paris. And I know it happened from those people because it only happened that one night. And because the next night, they had to all go down to Aix-en-Provence for the opening of Aix-en-Provence, you see. And they had no, yeah. more, no more disturbances after that. What if uh, the Cleveland Orchestra, they had a long rehearsal period, or did no. you step in with no, no, no rehearsal? No, I, 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 no, this was already scheduled. Yes. And, so I, you, and already I knew you had, what, one day of rehearsal, and, and you go the next day and you do your concert. So you had sung, the, you were able, uh, despite the bad back, well, to sure. sing the you one day of rehearsal. Place, stand, right. stand in place and you sing. Well, I empathize. I've, uh, I do have a bad back, and I remember once going through rehearsals for a concert Puritani with my back against a wall. Somehow it's more comfortable that way. Okay. And since the performance you was in... Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And somehow, because I, I, I was in pain, but I was able to get through mm -hmm. the performance. Mm -hmm. Had I had to move, it would have been another story. Stefan, I had yeah. that same thing happen to me here. The Metropolitan, I think it was the second performance, was it? I could barely stand. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to cancel. My voice is perfectly fine. I don't want to cancel this performance, but what do I do? You, so you, you, you yeah. do what you can do. The, I had them to, to, take, um, to give me some flat shoes, because that's a very rake stage here in, uh, for the uh, production of Aida. So they gave me some flat shoes, like little ballerina sandals, and they lowered the hem of my, of my costumes. Yeah. All, all and done in, in the same right. day. Sprayed the shoes down because they, they certainly were not gold originally. And uh, we did the best. We did what we could. As a matter of fact, it was a great performance. And nobody really knew that, that I was in, in great pain. Hmm. Doctor. And these you things vary from, we are. vary from one case to the next. Sometimes with a back problem, one is in real pain and it's tough, t tough to get around. Other it times it's not so bad. It so, Nabucco from Paris. Yeah, I think that's the right side. What size did it say there? Uh, B. Oy vey. Opening scene. I think it's that. I think it's that. The A side. The A side, yeah. Right. Grace Bumpery Nabucco. Nabucco. Listener of Reflections here on WKCRFM in New York, 89.9 on the dial. Peter Ransman, Stefan published the entire interview in Opera Fanatic magazine. Grace Bumbry is incredibly informative, and she's giving a lesson for every young singer. Publish it all, no matter how many pages it takes. 
Well, Grace Bumbry, I'd love to do exactly that uh, without touching a syllable. Uh, if you wish. I, it, it, would, it would be a privilege. So I have your permission just to transcribe the thing. You have. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, Paul, and that goes for listener comment. If you don't want your remarks published, <laughs> say so. And those may be edited for clarity and brevity. Not greatly, but still, uh, they're part of tonight, so I'd love to use them. Uh, and call them now, not, not weeks from now, after it's ready to go. Paul King, uh... What a battle, Kathleen, battle, reflections. I have none. Have you heard her? Mm, have I heard her? Have I heard her? I heard her years ago when she made her debut, I believe, at the Shepherdess in Tannhäuser. Mm. I... Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'll take I, I did hear her also in one of the galas where she sang Sophie, I believe. <coughs> With um, with uh, Elizabeth Soderstrom, I believe, and who was the other person? Um, Frederica von Stade, I believe, and I don't think I've heard anything else. Two. I have no, I really no opinion. Two callers, Mr. King and Bob Gold, uh, Mr. King of Brooklyn and Bob Gold of Park Avenue, asked about. Jesse Norman. Uh, Mr. King would like to know your appraisal of Norman as a singer. Mr. Gold uh, says Norman is pretentious, hiding behind a British accent. Does uh, he know Miss Norman? I mean, I don't know if he know if she if he knows her at all or not. He didn't say. And furthermore, whatever accent she chooses to to use is her business. I think we all decide how we want to speak. And um, nobody, no, nobody uh, can dictate to you how you how you should speak and how you should not speak. The main thing is is, is that you speak clearly. That's what's important. Now, whether she has a, a British accent or not is is really immaterial. I would think that the most important thing is how she sings. And then you know, there's an, there's an, another thing I'd like to say. I don't I don't think it's really very kind of of this person because I I think his. His mentality is, is, is rather warped. I don't know the gentleman, but I, but I think it's unfair of, of him to, uh, to make that kind of, of, re of a remark. I've, I believe that Jesse Norman has the right to use any, any accent she chooses to use. And, um, you know, nobody seems to, to say anything at all about the fact uh, if it's a white singer using a, um, um, a British accent. But just because it happens to be a black person, all of a sudden you, you've got something to say. I, 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 I really take a, a great exception to this. And uh, I, I wish you wouldn't have really, really wouldn't have, have called, made, made that call, actually. Well, let me play devil's advocate. True, callous, affected accents. So it seems if one compares various interviews, on some she's, she talks like a fish wife, on others she imitates the Queen of England. Uh, Marian Anderson, however, in public, referred to herself as we, and several black artists are known for that. Uh, Price is sometimes singled out. Shirley Ferret has come in for comment on the same subject. Uh, some people snicker. But if they choose to speak that way, that's really their business. So what? Mm. Well, we had the same discussion. I find it rather um, charming, actually. <laughs> 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 you had said earlier that if a white girl has a southern accent, that's considered charming. Exactly. But exactly. But if it's a black person, all of a sudden it's it, it's a draw that has to be gotten rid of. And you were speaking about black voices being singled out as black, saying, yes, they have a common denominator, but what of Slavic voices, what of Anglo-Saxon voices? Well, yes, I'm, I'm, I make that point, and I underline it again, uh, that there is a definite black voice. 
And it certainly is nothing to be ashamed of. On the contrary, I think it's something to be really quite proud of. Uh, especially when, in the view of the fact that you that when you hear a, a black singing voice, that you know immediately that it, that it is a special sound. Now, nobody seems to take a, take offense to a, 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 a Slavic sound, nor to an Italian sound, nor to an Anglo-Saxon sound, um, a German sound. We certainly have an Afro sound. We were African, we're African descendants, so we have a special sound too. Just because we're born in America does not mean that we have an American sound. We have our, our, a sound of, of our derivation, which happens to be Africa. Now, Bob Gold, far from being derisive, remarked, this is a wonderful show. Stefan is one of your best, and Bumbry is fantastic. I don't think he was being hostile in asking the question. So. Uh, I, but I but think some, sometimes people just have to be taught. They have to be told these things so they can, they can see them in a proper perspective. And I'm not being angry either. I'm not being hostile either. Bill McMullen of New York City. Did you ever catch Eleanor Stieber's Tosca or Butterfly? I? Yes. No, I never did. No, unfortunately. Well, he continued, Bumbry's Eboli is always sensational oh. and i like her zalame thank you uh john mangini of staten island fascinating show bumbry was excellent in forza was she e were you ever tempted he asks by mini in fanchula and do you have plans for further jocondas I've never been tempted by Mini in Fanchula. I've been asked any number of times, but I do not want to sing Mini. She does not even have an aria. It's the tenor's evening, as is Fedora. I will not sing it, God willing. <laughs> and uh, yes, I do have, um, have plans for more Gicondas. As a matter of fact, I have some um, um, next summer uh, if Caracalla gets its program together, gets its act together, I should be singing some in Caracalla next year, and the year after that in Barcelona. What's that like? Have what? you perform? You've performed in Caracalla? No, I never no, did. I, no. I've performed at uh, Verona and in Macerata, but never in Caracalla. I hear the acoustics are very bad, mm -hmm. and they have to use amplification. So I've been told. Yeah. yeah. Is that daunting? No, as a matter of fact, it's a help. I don't have to sing so hard, do yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that so the, pr the prejudice against amplification is unfounded? No. No, it's not unfounded. I think it depends on, on how it's amplified. Yeah. Because sometimes you get um, a very good um, sound engineer who knows what he's doing, and it makes it, he makes it sound almost um, uh, normal. But if you get um, a sound engineer who is not quite so talented, it can sound rather, uh, rather spooky. I'm going to be publishing an article on miking at the Met. If uh, what I have discovered What's is... What's mic at the Met? Well, there is a little bit of it, as I'll reveal in the article. But, if, uh, but it seems to be benign. Where uh, is this? I'll go into it later. I'd rather not spill... This is most interesting because I, I don't know a thing about I'd it. I'd rather not spill my scoop. Okay. But, but I'll tell you later. Right. Um, George Thompson <coughs> of Brooklyn. Grace Bumbry's speaking voice is a delight. Musical with extremely interesting rhythms and inflections. Stefan, we'll miss you next week. And we will send letters on account of you and our other favorite, Phil Schaap to the Columbia administration. As uh, regular listeners, who did end up replacing you in the canceled performances of Roberto de Vereur? Um, yeah, an English girl, Janet something. Janet, Janet, Janet. I can't remember her last name now. Did, did quite a fine job to it, as a matter of fact, as I, as I recall. And Mr. Risk asks, did you sing Sara ever? No. No. Never did. Uh, do you have an opinion as to how the role compares to Norma and Abigail? I haven't a clue. Mm -hmm. I haven't a clue. What of scheduling here at the Met? Uh, several people have asked about uh, future plans. What's 
Well, What's up, I Tommy? have next season Julieta in Tales of Hoffman. And after that, uh, there are no plans. Julieta is a lovely, sweet role, but hardly gives you reign to unleash your... hardly gives I you opportunity to unleash your 100%, temperament. I agree with you 100%. And I would think that they would have thought of something a little bit more interesting than, than Julietta for me. But that, that's the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. And after that? Uh, there, there are no plans. There are no plans at the Met, no. Why? But you see, one mustn't, one mustn't forget that the world does not begin and end with New York Metropolitan Opera. Yes. And that I do sing elsewhere. I am quite busy. I am not worrying about whether or not I sing at the Metropolitan. I would be delighted, of course, if I were, were on, the, on the roster and on the, on the schedule, for sure. But my job is singing. And whether it's at the Metropolitan or anywhere else in the world, the important thing is, is that I do that, which I do best, and that is sing. Doesn't matter where. Where else are you prefer? I'm singing all over Europe. I'm in, in Hamburg, I'm in Scala, I'm in Verona, I'm in Caracalla, I'm in London, I'm in Barcelona, I'm in uh, Paris, and I do recitals also. Jonathan Morris, self-styled as Grace Bumbry's pianist. Where are you appearing together? <coughs> We're appearing in uh, Nancy, Lille, Paris, Madrid, Barcelona, oh my dear. Uh, uh, Alicante, Alicante, Valencia, Vienna, Vienna you forgot Vienna, Vienna Rome, 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 that's Florence. right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> uh, we have a large tournament. Yeah. Well, who's your agent? In, Germ in, in Europe, uh -huh. I have um, Germinal Hilbert. Uh, the Hilbert Bureau in all in uh, Munich and in Paris. And here? Here is the um, Columbia Artists, the Bruce Simsky's division. And in Italy I have Giovanni Lupitin. What of the current Met regime uh, versus, say, Bing? Oh, there's a big difference. There's an enormous difference. I mean, I, I'm... You have to forgive me, who, who's ever a rooter for the, for the, the present-day uh, administration. But when you grew up in the Bing era and you were treated with so royally as I was treated, I, I have to think lovely and kindly on, on that period. I mean, I was, I was spoiled, rather, actually, by, by Mr. Bing, because I got almost every year a new production, and I had many, many performances uh, under, under his regime. And uh, I got along quite well with Mr. Bing, maybe because we were both Capricorns. And, uh, but be that as it may, um, I enjoyed it, and, and I miss it very much. Uh -huh. you, oh, you don't like Mr. Bing, I can hear that. No, 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 that, no, mm. no, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm preoccupied <laughs> with whether I've set the with level. your light. Level, yes, <laughs> yes, whether the board oh. is properly arrayed for, for the next election. Stefan, we want to use the turntable oh, now. Oh, by all means. Oh, wait. All right, I'll oh, try yeah. queuing blind. Uh, we may get the four, end of... And it needs to be cleaned. <laughs> right. Uh, we don't have a tape to put in while I... This uh, well, well, all right. You want me, to put this one last, to actually. And I uh, jump in here. I, I don't see a brush in WKCR. Uh, cut for... What is it? It's in Questa Regia from... Grace, you were saying... <laughs> I was saying, now you tell me which voice is that. Is it a mezzo or is it a soprano? I don't know. I think it one just ha I just have to sing that which fits my voice. Grace Bumbry, Jonathan Morris, how would you compare the two performances? I rather like the last one better because I find it more exciting. I find that that, that middle section seems to, to move on with more urgency than the, than the first time, than the first time around does. What Jonathan Morris. I feel pretty much the same way. I, I find that it was more Italianist, the way the Italians like it, and the way they really appreciate it, and the way they shape it. Like Even, but don't forget that Maestro Santi was the conductor for that, for that one, in, I think, wasn't he? Wasn't, did he conduct the one? No, 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 no. it wasn't. It was that, that Spanish fellow, Gomez, uh, oh. something Gomez. Yeah. 
he conducted because my society was sitting in the first row yeah. watching but in this in this in this last one it was a, an italian who was playing the piano and it was in italy with yeah. that italian tradition you know it was a gala with lots it of was a gala divas, with a whole yes. puccini gala with all the the puccini diva so to speak that was uh, magda olivero i believe was there she sang um what did she sing? Senza Mama? No, that was uh, Laila Gancha. I don't remember who. Laila Gancha sang, um, Katia Ricciorelli, Kotrubash. Um, oh, gee, I can't remember all the, all the ladies who sang on that, e on that evening. Who was the pianist? Uh, I've forgotten. Forgive me. Uh, it wasn't Jonathan. No. <laughs> he what? played better than that. <laughs> <laughs> what of those ladies, Gancha, uh -huh. Ricciorelli, opinions? Pardon me? Opinions about those ladies. Genger, Ricciarelli. Oh, well, I think um, Genger is worth talking about, but I don't think that, uh, at this point, that I don't think that Katya is worth talking about because Katya sort of let us down, I think. She had enormous, e an enormously beautiful voice. Mm -hmm. and, but I think she sort of got lazy or complacent or something and, and just didn't work really anymore. And um, she seemed to have lost all of that that beauty of voice that she that she had. She doesn't really use all of her voice anymore. Mm -hmm. She just sort of sings with with um, um, uh, just a, p a portion of it, and that's not really satisfying. You want to hear a whole voice. You want to hear something with 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 warmth, not just not just um, fluff, uh, fluff and and uh, and clouds. We want to hear a bit more mm -hmm. than that. And what of Layla Gensha? Oh, Layla Gensha. I, Layla was a very important singer. Mm -hmm. That was, mm -hmm. uh, for my m opinion, uh, she didn't really get her due because I think she came too close behind uh, Maria Callas. I mean, that's as simple as that. Uh, she had the same sort of intensity. She had the same sort of um, uh, uh, interest. In, in her profession as Maria. She also uh, knew how to sing for an audience. She knew what the audience wanted. And uh, she knew how to do pianissimi. She was a real, true artist. I enjoyed, I enjoyed working with Lila and go enjoyed also watching and listening to her. What did you sing with her? We did a number of Aida's at La Scala. We did also, she did the Octav Octavia to my uh, Popeya at La Scala, as a matter of fact, as well. I think she did, if I'm not mistaken, I think she did uh, Elisabetta from Don Carlos with me, huh? And, yeah. And, and uh, Gioconda. And yes, of course, she sang the Gioconda. I sang the Laura to her Gioconda in San Francisco many years ago. Bob Gold called back. He had asked earlier about Norman's speech to him uh -huh. affected, and he said, I meant no offense at all. I would welcome to hear Miss Bumpley's opinions on Jesse Norman, the artist. Well, uh, to be honest, I only heard Jesse Norman in one recital some years ago, and once at the gala here at the, uh, sorry, at the Met. I, I, which gala was that? Was that the Centennial? I think it was, and um, I don't think I've heard it outside of those. Oh no, sorry, uh, I heard her in um, the Trojans. Mm. It's a difficult uh, <laughs> voice to criticize, to critique, to critique, because uh, I, I, I don't really know it very well. I can't figure it out can't figure it out. I don't know whether it's soprano or mezzo, uh, or whether she's a recitalist, or whether she uh, should sing opera at all. I don't know. I don't know that voice that well. Why should those things perplex you, of all people? As I said, I don't know the voice that well. If yes. I, if I had, had a chance to listen to it more often, uh, perhaps I could, I could sit and analyze it a bit more. But I, at this point, I, I tend to think it's, 
it's one of those uh, swish and fark voices also, but uh, whose, whose repertoire has to be chosen very, very carefully. With, uh, do you think she, uh, do you find her ineffective in certain poems? I don't know what parts they are. What parts does she, does she sing? Well, I ask that because of your remark that her repertoire has to be chosen carefully. Are you suggesting that sometimes the, the choices are not? No, 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 not, not at all. Yeah. I, what I was, what I was referring to was the fact that when you, when you are a Swish and Fox singer, yeah. you have to, in any event, choose your, your repertoire um, rather carefully. And I would think for, for a, a woman of Jessie's size, that is already one problem, that she's got to choose that repertoire uh, very, very carefully, uh, because there's certain, I mean, certain limitations of, in movement. You can't just do everything. And then, but then um, beyond that, I think because the voice is uh, mezzo and soprano, you have to then find out what is good for me and what is bad and what is bad for me and then choose those things that are that are good and and to capitalize on those what have you yourself rejected as unsuitable well the thing that comes most quickly to mind is vitalia from um, clemenzo di tito years ago i was asked to sing vitalia on a recording with for, for Decca, and uh, uh, I waited a bit late to cancel out on them, but I, I felt that it was not the right, um, right music for me, not only the tessitura, but also the style, and uh, I, I, I just could not, I, I couldn't relate to it, so I had to cancel it, and uh, I can't think of anything else just now that would come to mind quickly. Brendan Brennan of New York City. Stefan, congratulations on the show, one of the most delightful. I love the Vickers story. Ah. But Marton's Tosca was the most exciting since Magda. Marton brought out more exciting singing from Domingo than I've heard in years. He was not distant and uninvolved, and the voice rang out with greater freedom than in years. Well, you know, that's, as I guess we said before, it's all a matter of opinion. And, you know, one has, to, one, one has to bear in mind that perhaps Domingo was not having as big a problem as he had last year or a few years. He's been having vocal problems. We all know that. It's not a secret. He's, he is in better voice now than he was last year at this time. So, of course, when you're in better voice, you can react easier. I, you know, the, the, this person has her right in saying what she, what, what she thinks. I, I, I don't agree with her about Ava, but be that as it may, that's, that's her, her opinion. What of uh, Domingo's vocal problems? What are or were they? I don't, I can't put my finger on them, but I know he was going through a very bad vocal, vocal problem. Didn't you hear it? Well, uh, I... He said, the, he said the reason was that he, uh, he, um... Had had gotten dust into his vocal cords from um, from the earthquake in Mexico. Mm. You look skeptical, quizzical. Who me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Brennan continue. Oh, Joe Levecki here. I'm sorry. Yeah. One comment blends into the other in my notes. The Turando excerpts are tremendously exciting. I only wish Grace Bumbry was singing Turando in the Met's new production this spring. Uh, she's an extremely interesting guest. I hope she comes back to the show. I've worn out her Aida recording <laughs> with Corelli. Um. Sebastian Biondo, a lovely lady, a great artist. The Bolshoi, how did you like it? And what of bass, Alexander uh, Ognistev, if I'm pronouncing that correctly? Your pronunciation is as good as mine, because I don't remember. I don't remember how they pronounced it. But uh, and I don't even don't even know if that was the same person who sang with me or not. If, if they say it, it was, then I I should take their word for it. Sebastian Biondo is an encyclopedia. Well, then he knows. Yes. All right, fine. You know, that's been certainly at least ten years ago. I can't really say I remember, 
um, the singers around me, except for there was a baritone who was mm -hmm. very good, whose name I can't remember, but perhaps it's Sebastian would know. He was quite good, very much a gentleman too, very helpful. And, uh, I, and this I, I bring to mind because don't forget that it's a foreign country, a country in which, which I, whose language I do not speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was really very kind and, 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 and warm and, and outgoing. Um, but the experience of having sung there was really very, was, was, was worth it. It was very interesting. It was exciting. Um, I enjoyed it. I had an enormous success. And what more could you ask for? <laughs> Rosina Wolf. Grace Bumpery not only sings with tremendous resonance, but also gleaming intensity. And that's where the thrill lies. And she asks, are you considering new roles? Well, I've been considering Turandot for a long time. I, cause I, I, I was supposed to do it about four years ago in, um, where was that, Jonathan? France, wasn't it? No, it was in Italy and in, and I think it was Naples and in Rio de Janeiro or Buenos mm -hmm. Aires, one of those. And something happened, they, and they were both canceled. And I think we did the Verdi Requiem instead, mm -hmm. and something else was put in. But however, it's 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 been in the back of my mind, and so I've I've learned it now, and uh, we worked on it this summer, Jonathan and I, and I must say that it is quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary. I would welcome the chance to sing a couple of performances after Eva Martin, <coughs> or after Gina Dimitrova. Brava. Then they would see what, what um, a dramatic soprano is about. Brava. Steve Leopold, Bumbry is the greatest Eboli ever heard. Thank you. Did she sing with Mario Del Monaco? No, I didn't. No, I'm sorry, sorry to say that. I did not have that opportunity. What of your recordings? Do you have favorites? Yeah, I have some favorites, sure. What? Actually, you'd be surprised that my very favorite is the Orfeo. Really? Orfeo e Euridice. How come? I just find the voice is so beautiful and clear and pure. It's so... I think because I had come off of a, of a holiday, of a vacation, and the voice was fresh as a daisy, and, and I had no difficulty in doing anything I wanted to do with it. I could make like, the slightest pianissimo, the biggest forte, within the realm of, of, uh, of Gluck, of course. And uh, I, just, I just find it extremely beautiful. Are there recordings that you would suggest we stay away from? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. No. But if someone out there wants to make a beginning, would you say start with the Orfeo, even though that is not the kind of material associated with No, you? I would say they should start with Carmen. Because then, you know, the, the story is so easy for, for one to understand, and uh, the music goes nicely into the ear, and has nice rhythm, and uh, it's, it's exciting. I, I think one should start with Carmen. Mm. What of some of these roles, Turanto, Abigail, uh, death is, uh, Lane in particular is said to be a throat buster. It is. It is. It's quite difficult, I must tell you that, because it's got the, the, the enormous stretches, an enormous jumps, sometimes of, of two octaves. You have a high C, uh, and then you go down to a C, to, to middle C. It's really extremely difficult. Uh, but that is, once you get past the first act, then you're home free. Because the first act is where, is where you have these enormous stretches of, of, um, of uh, tessitura, not tessitura, of... of um, uh, uh, intervals. Intervals, intervals, thank you. And, um, but fortunately that comes at the beginning of the opera. Mm -hmm. So you can get your nerves together for that and then go on to the other. For, for me, it's easier that way. There may be some people who, like, who, who, find, the, who find that the first act is easier, and, and, the, and from the second act on, it's is, is more difficult. It all depends upon your own vocal capacities. For me, I find it, as I said initially, the first act is the hardest, and, and after the, after the, from the aria on, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, at home. Norma. 
Oh, too bad I didn't bring some of Norman with me tonight, but I couldn't find anything in my, among my things because, you know, I don't live here, so oh. all of my library is not here. But Norma is really my very favorite opera, and, and I, I, I just think it's a pity that they don't do it at the Metropolitan. Um, the, I heard the one with, with um, Renato Scotto, and uh, unfortunately she was, she was uh, you know, working under very bad circumstances, and uh, things didn't go as well as she, th as she thought they were going to go. And I don't really believe that, it's, that it is the opera for her in the first place. But be that as it may, it is an opera that should be at the Metropolitan Opera. And I would like very much to sing it there. Is Lavarne anti bel canto? I don't know, but that's what I've been told. I, I, I don't know what he is. How does the Met compare to European houses? In casting or what? Casting <laughs> rehearsal conditions. For example, if one is in the second cast, uh, does one get orchestra rehearsal at the Met? I don't know. I've never been in the second cast, so I don't really know. Uh, uh, what about it in Europe? I would say no. Yeah. I cannot imagine that uh, one who's in the second cast would get would get orchestra rehearsals in, anywhere, either in Europe or in America. I can't imagine. I can't imagine why. Mm. Uh, listen, you know, first of all, rehearsals are, are, are at a premium anyway or with orchestra. So I, I can't imagine that, that, that they would schedule a rehearsal with the second, with the second cast. Mm. What Unfortunately. Of, what of audiences? Oh, the, well, the audiences are pretty much the same in, when, in, in reception because, you know, when you get good singers, you're going to get pretty much, in, in, uh, pretty much the, same, the same reaction. However, the Italian audience is much, much more uh, receptive and much, much more critical and much, much more, <laughs> more um, um, excitable. I love them. I love it because they make you have to sing. They make you want to sing. I enjoy singing in Italy because the Italians are so difficult to please. Misadventures. Huh? Misadventures before them. Things that went wrong. Anecdotes. Reminiscences. John, I can tell one. He knows one about the uh, Giaconda in, uh, in, uh, in Naples. I can't remember all the details. Oh, yes, yes. Since there was a, a Joconda in April, was it about five years ago? Something like Something that. Like that. And uh, there was one of the singers, I think she was the Laura, and she had a tracheitis. And she, and during the rehearsal period, she asked to be excused from the rehearsal, and they did not. And somehow or another, this tracheitis <laughs> tripped its way through the cast. And to make a long story short, they were supposed to have a turandot in uh, Naples, and I think Caballé was, or was supposed to be the turandot, and she did not show. And the audience was very dissatisfied. So when it came time for the Gioconda, and Madame Bumbley was not well, they thought that she was not there. And there was this young singer who the conductor and his wife were training, and they put her <laughs> out on the stage, <laughs> and they ran her home. So they would not even allow her to sing because they thought that they had the, uh, the, management. The, the management had pulled a quick one on them and it just kind of dropped using very big name stars and had no shows as far as the stars are concerned. But it was not true. And in this case of Miss Bumby, because you, you were sick and you did show up and uh, it was announced from the pit by the conductor to an audience that was throwing their lunch, <laughs> food, <laughs> curse words, and insults. And the way they got their attention was they put the theater into darkness because I was there for a minute to get their attention. And then Maestro Patene from the, uh, from the conductor's podium also gave a few curse words and <laughs> <laughs> to, to gain their attention and told them that it was their privilege to do what they wanted to do. But if they were not willing to listen, they would have to come back when Madame Bumble was better, I think, which was the following week. Mm -hmm. And that would, be, that would be the premiere. And so... <laughs> How those little antidotes go. <laughs> Do you typically travel with uh, Grace? We travel a lot together, yes. Yeah. How many people go with you? I usually travel alone. <laughs> really? I usually travel alone, but uh, I have people who meet me to, mm. to help me do what I have to do. Uh, 
And uh -huh. as a matter of fact, Jonathan usually prepares me with almost all of my operas. You live in Switzerland. You've only Julietta slated for the Met. When will New York get to hear you otherwise? I don't know. Too I don't bad know. you're not singing in Carnegie Hall next week after tonight. What's happening next week? Well, too bad you don't have a... So we could all go. There are oh, quite a few people, I see, I'm sure. I see what yeah. you mean. Well, perhaps we might schedule one. That you would know, be though, wonderful. That's easier to schedule than scheduling something at the Metropolitan. Yeah. So perhaps we can schedule something on our own. That would that would that would be fantastic. But I, yeah. it would be nice if I if if the New York public could hear me in my in my new things in my new roles. Let's say like a, a Turandot and a Norma, which they've never heard me sing, and uh, Ballo and Mascara, Ballo and Mascara, and things like that. They've never heard. They've never even heard my heard my Aida. They've only heard me as Amneris. Mind you, I prefer Amneris. Really? How yes, come? Yes, I do. I do. I do. Why? Well, I find her much, much more um, interesting in one respect. The music is very, very dramatic, and um, I, I think she pretty much <laughs> kind of demands the con the attention of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like the third act of uh, of uh, Aida. Once you get past the Opatria Mia, of course. Um, you don't like the Opatria Mia? Uh, uh, I don't like the Opatria Mia. No, I don't. He doesn't like you, or you don't like I, it? I don't, I'm, I'm frightened to death of it, actually. I, I, I think all the sopranos huh? are, except for Leontine Price, who just sits up there as if she's walking around in the clouds, but not even worrying about it. But um, uh, I, I must tell you, I must have to, have to admit that I, I do think about it when hmm. I'm uh, singing the uh, Opatria Mia. Just but because once of the one I get note? That, huh? Because of the one note? It's difficult. It's psychologically difficult for me, yeah. The C, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it's I think it's, a, it's the way I get to that C. It, it seems like it's a mile or ten miles between that B flat and that C. Mm -hmm. It takes forever to get there. But I think I pretty much, I'm, I'm still psyching myself up. I'm still working on that. Do you switch the syllables around as most do at that point? I switch them around. Well, let's see. Uh, it's written my pew, ooh, 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 I think, and most sing my pew breath, ah, 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 ah. Yeah, nearly everyone except I think Kapaye does that. I take the breath after, after the, huh? A natural? Mm -hmm. No, Johnson. It goes from C to A to G, A, B flat, C. Now, I'm talking about, for me, the, 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 the phrase is... I go, I, for me, I take the breath before mm. the G. Mm. The breath before the G, and I, and I take those four notes in, in one. Mm. G, A flat, B flat, C. Yeah. Da, 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 D. Ba, 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 ba. For me, that's it. Mm. I didn't get your, was that, what's your, I never well, heard of any other way to, to sing it. Oh, uh, no one sings it as written, and I think this is the standard way. Th it's written, I think, without a breath, all on the vowel, ooh, but who sings it that way? Caballé on record. Where? Where's it written there? My few. <laughs> I think. My few are. That's the way it stares up at us from the score. Oh, now, I see, whether you're talking about the vowel, oh, I see, yeah. I see, I see. But does it matter? I shouldn't think. No, wouldn't think so. I'm not aware that, uh, well, certainly on turn of the century might, records, I no one did that. it that might be a good vowel to sing it on. <laughs> yeah. I never thought of that. <laughs> 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 Work on this one. <laughs> yeah, that might just be the trick. Uh, what do you say, Conlon? Well, that's the way, yeah, that, that's the way he wrote it. Maybe he knew something, uh, yeah. Do you know, as a matter of fact, Jonathan brought it to my attention in, in Norma, in the Casa Diva, you know, singers have decided to, they, to end it a certain way, which is more, more amenable to them. But I tried it their way, traditional, their traditional mm -hmm. way. Well, it doesn't work for me. So we, we, he brought to my attention to do it the way the, the composer wrote it. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it works best for me. In what way does it work better? What is the problem with the traditional way? I don't know. It, 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 takes, it gives me the wrong breathing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Puts the puts the um, weight in the wrong place. I, I I believe. I don't really know the reason. I just know it works better. What's it? What was it like singing Nabucco at the City Opera? 
How did that compare to performing at the Met? Pardon me? Yes? There's an enormous difference. How would you describe it? Well, the Metropolitan is the Metropolitan Opera. Yes. And City Opera is City Opera. You found the experience... There's, listen, there is, no, there is no comparison. The Metropolitan still is the biggest and the best opera house we have in America. You cannot compare the State Opera, the State Theater, with the Metropolitan. Where were the State Opera's shortcomings most obvious? I would, I don't know. I would think in its, in its, in its, um, musical, uh, what do you call it, musical staff. Were the singers ill? I mean, the conductors I had were, especially one of them was, was not up to par. I'm sorry, who was that? Uh, uh, uh German's man, German I man's name. I've forgotten his name. I, you know, I have a, I have a selective memory. Uh -huh. Things I don't want to remember, I immediately forget. And I don't remember his name at all. Uh, it was a German man, I've forgotten now. And it's a completely different level. The whole, the whole, well, it, 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 you can't compare the two. Yes. How can you, uh, it, it's unfair. Did they give you orchestra rehearsal? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. But notwithstanding that, they just couldn't make it work. Did you, did you have to fight to generate electricity? Oh, no. <laughs> no, there was electricity, all right. Because Maybe that was why there was electricity, because there was always fights. Really? What was no, some but of you the see, fights? You, you have to remember, the, the city opera is a city opera, and it, you cannot even you put it in the, same, in the same breath as the Metropolitan. The Metropolitan has an enormously long tradition as being the number one opera house in America. They've always had great singers at yeah. the Metropolitan. The, the city opera is an opera house where, where the young singers who are just beginning are, are coming in there. I mean, they're, they're making their debuts there. They're, make, they're starting their careers off. And with the Metropolitan, it's a place where you go once you have made it. You do not, you're not supposed to go to the Metropolitan uh, as, as a beginner. I take it you would as soon not return to the City Opera. I think you pretty much got that point clear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Paul, please. Miss um, Bumber, your yes. singing is obviously very passionate and exciting and Italian. Uh, you are never dull. And a lot of American singers, even though they sing beautifully, come across as bland, particularly in the Italian repertoire. Now, I don't think it's because Americans don't have personality, because we have created great musical comedy stars and great pop singers. Definitely. Um, and yet you have no trouble in this respect. Can you comment on this? Uh, I, I, I really don't know. You, you don't think that, it, that it's, a, a, it's a personal thing? It only has anything to do with, with nationalities or that sort of thing. I think it has to do with the individual. I mean, either you have, um, you have a, a fire or an, 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 an expression or you, or you don't. But I think it can be learned. Well, now, Johnny, there are a lot of singers, Met opera singers, who will appear on the Johnny Carson show and be funny as hell, be witty, tell jokes, just be bursting with personality. You put them on the stage singing Verdi, and nothing happens. Um, in other words, they seem to have trouble identifying with, with those personaggi. You don't. Um, but you know, there are some people who uh, can express themselves um, easier in a joke. But and and uh, and and in in a close a close company. But the moment they get onto stage, they they, they clam up. That's just that's, that's just a, a characteristic of the, of those people. But that doesn't mean that that they they couldn't be made to do it or couldn't be taught to do it. I think it's a it's a matter of of exposure, a matter of 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 being taught, and uh, a, a matter of being free. A lot of people don't really feel comfortable with themselves on stage. They feel embarrassed. And and perhaps they hide behind the language. I don't know. Maybe that's a that's only my little my little um, theory. But I, I think a lot of times they they, they just are, are embarrassed with what they do and they would rather what, what they feel more more comfortable in in just in just singing and not having to not having to act. Don't forget being on, being on the metropolitan opera stage. 
is a chore. I mean, you have to have your wits about you. You have a, 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 a lot to, to cope with and, and, and to go up against. You have 4,000 people out there that you've got to entertain. You've got to keep them entertained constantly. You have to concentrate the entire time. And concentrating for long stretches for 4,000 persons is not easy. You have to do it, but, but, I, but my, my um, uh, clue has been in to just forget grace. Don't even think about grace. Think about that role that you're doing. And every moment is filled out with, with, a, with a thought process. I go from, let's say, from the, if I move from A to B, I, I have a reason from go, for going from A to B, not just because I, the director says go over there. I have got to think about why am I going there? Why does the composer want me to go there? Why does the, does the director want me to go there? And all those things have already gelled by the time I get onto the stage. So all those, from the moment I go from A to B, there is a, a full reason for doing it. And, and not only the, the, why I do it, but in how I do it. Uh, the, the movement, or the, or the movement of the body, movement of the hand, the movement of the head, everything is, already, is, 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 is one, big, um, one big flow. Did you have to learn to identify with these these uh, personaggi, or was it there? No, I don't. I don't think you. I don't think you have it immediately by by birth. Nobody gave it to you. you no. It wasn't inherited. You had to study it. You you do your homework. You go to the libraries. You find whatever is is is, is possible for you to find. You do your research work, and you try your your best to become to become that person. I mean, whether, whether it's, it's talk,